Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and call us to order at 9.35. Four. Four a.m. Pacific time. If you need me to put the agenda back up, I will. Just wanted to grab. I believe our first item of business is attendance and roll call. Nope, it's opportunity for public comment. Um, do we have any non-LNC members who would like to give public comment? Hi, um, we're live on YouTube right now, correct? Fantastic. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, if you could come up to the front of the room um, and share your name, and you've got about two minutes. Good morning, my name is Michael Prusnick. I'm a Orange County Libertarian Party member and winner of the uh, theme contest for the posted rules on LT Edia as detailed in the full complaint that I've submitted to the full board. Due to time limits, I will only be touching on a few points here. I would like to point out that the rules clearly said that the winner is the theme with the most dollars by 625, the most dollars donated. On 627, I had an email from the then executive director congratulating me on achieving such a goal. However, instead of declaring the role the winner, my theme, on 628, it was announced that the contest would be continuing under different rules. I represent my donors, and as such, I feel they were misled about how their donations would be used to determine the winner. They are entitled to their victory or to their money back with interest, in my opinion. All of my reasonable efforts and offers to resolve this issue have been rejected. One, declare rule the winner. Two, prove the rules were legally changed. Three, prove the rules could legally be ignored. Four, give role an equivalent award. Five, refund contest donations. That would be all contest donations. And seven, I even offered, if I'm wrong, say so publicly through an agenda item at today's meeting denouncing my claims and issuing me a cease and desist order, also rejected. Instead, against my wishes, my theme donations were refunded to me and my national membership was revoked. The most serious issue for the LP membership I'd like to bring is the fact that a board member initially told me they didn't know about the contest deadlines, but later admitted to making those deadline changes. We cannot have board members who promote misleading responses <coughs> to official complaints, nor can we have board members that protect such behavior. As such, I must call for the entire board to resign or otherwise be removed from office as allowed by the rules of order. I will be making my case further on my personal website, who's.org, L-P-T-C, that's P-R-U-Z dot O-R-G, slash L-P-T-C for Libertarian Party Theme Contest. Thank you. That's my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, and you're pointing up the chair. Can you share your name, please? I will. Good morning. I'm Vera Prisnick, OCLP member. <clears throat> In the theme contest rules, the LP advertised, quote, donate to your preferred theme, unquote. I donated to roll based on this and the advertised judging criteria and deadlines posted publicly to LPDA, highest total contributions by June 25th. On June 27th, the executive director confirmed role was the leading theme. However, instead of declaring role the winner, the next day it was announced that the contest would be extended. I contributed my hard-earned money based on the posted rules. Since the rules changed and at least two other role donors received full refunds, I too asked for my full refund. My request was denied, uh, with my behavior being characterized as, quote, inappropriate, unquote, and both irrational and petty unquote. As disabled, as a disabled female Arab immigrant, and as a member 
of four historically marginalized classes. I'm tired of being personally insulted for asking that I be treated the same way as straight white Christian males. This leadership team has lost its way. I ask you to admit and fix this mistake without delay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any other public comment? Mr. Ferreira? Hello, everyone. Even though I'm wearing a Dave Smith Be Consistent shirt, and I'm here to tell you guys to be consistent. Um, I'm just here to welcome you. Uh, for the last couple of years, we've been trying to get you guys to come to the West Coast of California. I'm so glad you finally made it. Welcome to California. Enjoy our beautiful weather. Eat our great food. Come back. We really like it when you come here. Those of us on the West Coast always have to travel to the East Coast to come to these meetings. It gets tiring. So I know some of you are thinking, hey, it's real tiring for me to come to the West Coast. Think about doing that four or five times for every one time. You have to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ferreira. Um, any additional public comment? Uh, do we have public comment from an LNC member? Join us up front, please. Hello, everybody. I'm Adam Hammond, brand new regional one rep. Pleasure to meet you all. I was asked to read this, so I am going to read this. I, Hannah Goodman, that's not me, <laughs> have asked Mr. Hammond, my regional representative, that's me, to make a statement on my, my behalf, and he has accepted. I have been a voice of unfiltered criticism and critique, offering my perspective of the workings of the National Party. I'd like to commend the actions of Ms. McArdle for taking the helm and working diligently and methodically to correct the course and steer the party into a productive direction. I agree. She has my full support and admiration, admiration for the job she's doing. I have the honor of serving as the chair of the Libertarian Party of Colorado. Our affiliate's mission focuses on radically reshaping Colorado's political landscape. This work extends beyond traditional election strategies. It involves fundamentally changing how we operate. The application of project management systems are how we have done this. This has enabled us to effectively implement the principles of project decentralized revolution. This systematic approach has led to the highest recurring donations in LPCO's recent history. Uh, by combining my experience in driving operational excellence and organizational methods with Ms. McCarville's unifying and conquering, conquering, leadership style, I believe we can form a powerful team. Therefore, it is with great excitement and a sense of duty to our shared values that I, Hannah Goodman, that's her, not me, announce my candidacy for Vice Chairman of the LNC. I stand ready to support Ms. McCardle and bring my radically organized style to the national level. Copies. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Heyman. Do we have any other public comment today? All right. If not, we're going to go to our next agenda item, which is attendance roll call. Madam Secretary, whenever you are ready. Okay, Ms. McCardle. Are we missing our chair? No, she's right here, President. Mr. Watkins? Here. Mr. Hagopian? Here. I am present. Mr. Blankenship? I do not believe he is here. Gonna give me a moment to make my little notations. Mr. Malagon? Present. Mr. Nakela? He's not present. Mr. Rufo? By the good graces of God, I have arrived. <laughs> Ms. Janiscavage? Here. Mr. Banner? Present. Mr. Dassing, I do not believe is here. Mr. Ford? Here. Mr. Heyman? Present. Ms. Hayes? Here. Mr. Nana? <laughs> <laughs> not present. It, yet. Um, Mr. Tunyevich just emailed the list. He would not be able to be here. Ms. Vest? Okay, one moment. Ms. Vest is not present. Mr. Alstead? Here. Mr. Cowan? 
I thought I saw Mr. Cowan? Present. Thank you. Um, there's a newly elected Region 7 alternate. I don't expect him to be here, but he's officially part of the LLC. So, Mr. Dar? Present. Mr. Hall? Not present. Mr. Hirsch? Present. Mr. Hyman? Not present. And that Bill had, Mr. Redpath had let me know he couldn't be here. So, um, Madam Chair, all the officers are present. Two at larges are absent. We have no one from Region 5, no one from Region 6, and no one from Region 7. Um, Mr. Hirsch will be sitting in for Region 3. Um, pending Mr. Nana's attendance. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Uh, next agenda item is adoption of agenda. So everyone, please take a look. I'm gonna make one um, adjustment. Does anyone else have any issues with the agenda? I'd like to move to strike the regions that are not here, the regional boards for those that are not here. We won't strike the, the region, region, but we will strike the <laughs> report. <laughs> Do it. I actually second the vice chair. Okay. So it's been moved and seconded to strike the reports of regions five, six, and seven. Any objections? I wanted to just look because we did not get all regional reports. I wanted to see if we yep. had reports. So you're not taking them out of the minutes. You're just taking them out of the oral presentations. Correct. No, anyone who submitted a report, it will be attached to the minutes. We're not going to strike it. Just because we're not going to Correct. The Correct. It reports all reports. So we, I want to see. Six. I believe we have reports from all those regions. Mr. Ford, do you have a report for me? I know you're here, but. I checked it up uh, this morning. Oh, when, or like, a, okay, I'll check it out during a break. Thank you for your patience. Okay, I'll, pu I'll, I'll put that up there. Okay, we do have reports from each of those regions. Okay, great. Any objections? Going once, going twice. Hearing none, all right, the agenda is amended uh, to remove those regional reports. I, I'm also going to move to amend the agenda to continue staff reports tomorrow morning after public comment for how long madam chair by 10 minutes can i get a second can i get an amen, amen. okay thank you uh, it's been moved and seconded to continue staff reports tomorrow morning for 10 minutes. Uh, it'll be the first uh, item after public comment. Any objections? Going once, going twice. I had a question, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, there was a motion just passed by the Convention Oversight Committee, and our Convention Oversight Committee Chair is being very inattentive, so I'm waiting to get it. Thank you, Mr. Maligon, for joining the group. <laughs> Uh, so so there was a motion passed by the Convention Oversight Committee. If there were to be LNC discussion or comment on that, would that be appropriate at the time of that report? Is that the appropriate time for that? Regarding the anything related to the COC? Yeah, a, a, schedule, a, schedule, a convention schedule. Yeah, I believe so. And how long did we dedicate to COC? You've got 30 minutes. Okay, that's funny. Okay. And that 85 is not supposed to be sitting there. All right. That was because I was adding up. Uh, I just noticed uh, that. Yes. I mean, I just it's a question for the secretary. Would any of that have to be in the session? Like that I don't believe Potentially. so. Potentially. Well, I mean, that would be up to you. But what I'm envisioning, no. But you might feel differently as we get into discussion. But we can make that call in real time. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, did I say that was amended? For, no, you didn't. Okay, any objections to the staff? For 10 minutes, yeah. For 10 minutes to 
tomorrow. Going once, going twice, hearing none. Okay, the agenda is adopted. Any additional agenda changes? I'd like to add this entry, Mr. Nana, to the agenda for reasons. <laughs> I object to the consideration of the question. <laughs> Since you are all the ones who facilitated in having him be indisposed this morning. Yeah, we, we were accomplices. All right. Okay, let's uh, let's move on to our next agenda item. Report of potential conflicts of interest. Okay. I would ask everyone to really review those that are on the one note because I don't believe everyone has kept it up to date or give them given them all to me um, and somehow they didn't get copied I, I will copy them in there throughout the day please look at them I oh it's not showing up on mine so I just must have a slow connect oh that's credentials check I'm a dummy here we go I know what some people assume is oh the secretary knows that I got X position I do not change these even if I know you're not in a position anymore because they're your report. I, I do, do not proactively change anything. So for um, instance, I know he's not here, but I don't have anything for Mr. Dassing. I don't know if he has any kind of positions he should, but it's very unusual not to have any. Ms. Hayes, um, Mr. Hyman, I'm just looking at the ones I have none for, Mr. Tunievich. Ms. Vest. So those with none or just one, I ask that you really take a look at it. Look what other people disclosed. It, it's kind of a matter of conscience. Some people don't think some things need to be because they're pretty minor. I would suggest you over disclose. But if you could please take a look at it and I'd like to update it this weekend if anyone has ones that need to be taken off or added. Thank you, Madam Secretary. All right. Oh, you're so correct. Thank you. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to adopt the agenda as amended. Any objections? Going once, going twice. Okay, the agenda is adopted as amended. All right, thank you very much. Okay, let's gonna let's jump into officer reports. Are we ready? All right. First one up is the chair's report. I submitted a written report a week ago. I wanna just run over some highlights for the sake of the people who are on the live stream who may not be tuning in or looking them up on uh, online. Everything is online in a OneNote, I believe. There you go. tinyurl.com forward slash DECLNC2023. Uh, progress report on our 90-day turnaround. Uh, I set several goals for us to complete in 90 days. It has been 90 days. I wanted us to do to engage in more fundraising activity. We have absolutely done that. We have brought back direct mail appeals. We have an editorial calendar that's jam-packed full of email appeals. That includes uh, requests for for fundraising and also just some interesting interesting libertarian things that that pop up here and there we're including a lot more news on the goings of the the party and events like today like this evening's event um we've got a fundraiser app fundraising event this evening and we're planning one for potentially march we've expanded our development team and all of that has been really helpful for improving our financial situation uh, August brought in about $74,000. September, we broke 100K. October, we broke 180K. Um, November, we came just shy of our goal. I believe we're around $124,000 when I wanted us to be at 125. So I'm a little bit frustrated there, but we've made some significant progress and it looks like we have maintained it, which is a very good, um, a good thing. 
And December, I am pushing really hard for us to break 125K to make up for our $1,000 shortfall in November. That's a, those are rough estimates. You can find actual numbers generally on our end of month reports. Does that include convention revenue? Uh, yes, it does. Why are you including that, Angela? It's very simple. So when I talk about how much money I raised, this number of dollars came into our bank account. This many apples in the basket. That's it. These are not, I'm not giving you technical accounting reports, FEC reports. I'm telling you based on how much money I see come into the bank every day. Every electronic donation that comes into the party goes through my inbox. I have a very good idea of how much money comes in and out. And I'm doing, I'm, I'm going above and beyond to share that number with you. So for those of you who might be wondering, but mm, excuse me, Ms. McArdle, how much of that was convention revenue? <laughs> you can sit tight and you can check the, the numbers in the reporting. I'm not doing some weird thing. I'm, I'm sharing information with you. So I hope people will be grateful that I'm that engaged with our finances. So that's a little bit on our finances. How dare I? Um, uh, you know, another thing, uh, staffing. From from the from the beginning of our term through like a good you know six months in, staff dwindled and dwindled and dwindled. And from my perspective, that really impacted our revenue stream. It hurt our revenue stream. It hurt our ability to to finish and complete projects. So I staffed up. We've expanded staff quite a bit. Uh, you will see in some of the reports that we've uploaded, we'll, we'll have a breakdown of all who all is on staff right now and include a, a couple of volunteers, maybe one slave. Um, that's me. And I think it's been extremely helpful. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, I think it's the right decision. I love it. You know, if I have the opportunity to make one more hire or to just bring someone from a part-time to a full-time position next year, I may do that. But otherwise, I'm very happy with where we're at with staff right now. Um, another thing that I touched on was customer service. Some of the staffing changes that we've made, hiring more people on, is to help customer service. And when I talk about customer service, it's really, you know, are we doing a good job of taking care of our members and our affiliates? And I think that we're having much faster response times with member requests, particularly with renewals, cancellations, changing um, the, the donation amount. Those, almost all of them come directly through my inbox as well when it comes to I want to renew, I want to cancel, I want to change the amount. Oh, Adblock is installing on my laptop right now. Lovely. Um, the customer service area where I know we are still having shortfalls is with Civi CRM. And I did hire an additional IT person and I do believe that that is helping, but we, be, we inherited such a backlog of Civi help tickets and created such a, as our CTO will talk about it later, you know, technical debt problem, that it is very difficult to catch up with that. But it is on the forefront of my mind and we are gonna be trying very hard to address that in 2024 and I'm confident that we're gonna be able to make some good changes. Um, and I wanna say too that I appreciate the pa people being patient on Civi CRM and I understand when people have been impatient because it is a sucky situation and, and it is not ideal. And, and so I am sympathetic you know, to people who have gone off of the CRM and people who have, who have had criticisms of it. It's, it's a difficult position for us to be in. We did not have the manpower to tackle all those changes. And I don't even think that it's, I'm not sure that we would have been able to have that manpower unless I'd hired like five people, an entire like team Unless I transformed us into essentially an IT company. And that ultimately that's not what we are and we don't have the budget for it. Candidates and state chair outreach, let's, let's move on to that. We got 38, I think it's 39 now candidates who were elected in 2023. Thank you all so much. Congratulations to you, you guys are awesome. Also thank you, yeah, a little clap for candidates, woo. That's literally why we're doing this. Um, Thank you to the people who volunteered for them as well. I feel like campaign volunteers are, are the unsung heroes. Uh, we are gonna be holding a candidate's postmortem Q&A on Wednesday, December 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern, just so they can jump on, tell us what went right, what went wrong. Uh, what can we do as the LNC to help them in 2024 if they decide to run again? 
So there are things we can and things we can't do. I want to hear from them directly. You know, we, providing voter gravity is, is a real game changer. One of the things that I have heard a lot of feedback is people need more volunteers. And it is possible that we can start working right now to try to find a way to scrape up some more volunteers across the country. So we'll be hearing from them. Um, we've been trying to also improve a relationship with state chairs so that we can have a more collaborative relationship and work on projects together. That's one of the things that I really like about Operation Warhawk removal is we've had two meetings now where we've reached out to state chairs directly. I want to involve them. You know, this is not this is not a straight democracy where we're going to pull the state chairs to make every decision, but your your input and your opinions do matter because we want to make sure we're doing things that you're interested in and that you support. So please reach out if you're a state chair and you're you're interested in getting involved with us or just sharing sharing your opinions. Um, LNC board and and staff culture. You know the LNC tends to become extremely dysfunctional in like the last six months of the term. Historically, that's what a lot of people say. Um, I think. I think we're going to skate by. I think we're going to make it. I think we're going to not fall apart. I think we're going to do a really good job and things are going to be awesome. So I challenge you all to be awesome. Be excellent. Be excellent to each other. Some sort of Bill and Ted quote in there. Um, let's do it. Like, let's make a lot of money. Let's do a good job of encouraging each other. Let's take care of our regions. Let's take care of our members and let's make this a really Badass period of time leading up to the 2024 presidential election. And whatever our, whoever our candidate is, let's do a damn good job of welcoming them in at the national convention. And let's just make this, I want the rest of the country to have FOMO. I want them to see the Libertarian Party and they're like, damn, I wish that I was in that party. They look like they're having so much fun. All these people who are up in the presidential debates, which we all know are really the vice presidential debates in the GOP, like that exudes loser energy. I want us to be the awesome people where they're like, man, I wish I could get in on that. Let's let's try to pull all that attention over here. And you know, Democratic Party, they don't they don't have any energy. We're not sure if they have a pulse in their <coughs> candidate. So we're already above them on that. At least every single one of our candidates is alive. <laughs> are you sure? So thank you guys. Um, I will take any questions if you have them. Yes, Mr. Maligon. Sure. I do have photographic proof that we are fun. Uh, if, if anyone wants to see it, so that's FOMO. So we capitalize on FOMO. Any other questions? Uh, Madam Secretary, and then to Mr. Ford. You may have comments to, to in response to the comments, but first of all, just I know this isn't technically a point of information, but just so you know, I've been told that the Live feed is so bad, it's not even watchable. Both the audio and video are horrible. Um, it's something I want to point out, because this keeps coming up as an issue. Our bylaws do not require us to do a live feed. I love having a live feed. But what our bylaws say is anybody in the audience can record the meeting and do with that recording what they will. That was an issue like 20 years ago, and that's why it's in the bylaws. But if anyone can hear this, I'm doing a recording for my minutes. I'll upload my audio recording, and hopefully that will please some people. But there's no bylaws requirement for us to even do this. The system that we have, I realize, is not good. This was purchased and decided upon last term. This isn't our system. It needs. I firmly think we need microphones in front of everybody in a full audio board. I got voted down on that. However, we're not violating the bylaws because the bylaws don't require us to live stream. It's, I'll upload my recording. If anyone who's in the audience wants to video it, I'll get it on the YouTube channel. That's that's the best we can do. But for, for Madam Chair, mm -hmm. um, uh, Crap, I, I don't even understand my own notes. Mm. Um, I, I, do, I think the, bo the board culture has actually improved. Agreed. And I've been on the LNC since 2016 with a lot of good people. This isn't a criticism of anyone, but it's true. We get tired of each other yep. by the last six months, and I haven't seen board culture ever improve. There you go. And it, it's improved, but I think part of it improves by, and this was a lesson I didn't really learn very well till last term, so I'll accept whatever fault for that is. If someone's super annoying you, I get it. You you want to respond, 
but there's a good rule of one and done respond once and then do like the Disney princess and let it go and everything gets better so you know people are going to annoy each other say your response and then move on to what's next best for the party because the bickering on the list and I've done it I've been there it, it doesn't do anything you feel good for five minutes and nice. then the rest of the board feels like shit all right so we want what's that disney movie oh uh, isn't it frozen. frozen frozen we want frozen energy not ursula energy um i also thank you so much i want to also say um to anyone comp not complaining um frustrated by our it challenges i i hear you i i'm also frustrated by our um lackluster live stream if you would like to donate to the party to allow us to have a better live stream a stronger hotspot whatever it is i would love that in fact if you want to get around budget challenges and make sure we have it you could do an in-kind donation of the equipment we would just i would adore you okay uh additional questions mr malagon back off what the secretary said so staff was informed as soon as people's frustrations were made known and they can only do so much so again this comes out of the equipment they're going to do their best to see what they can do also and let's so speak up yeah oh. and please speak up for my recording because i will upload this recording <laughs> okay um, yeah. so mr Ford. yeah so staff has been informed that the live stream is not you know up to stuff and they're doing what they can but uh, they're working on it now, but as frustrations mount, just so everyone's aware, we are aware of it, and you know, texting us or tweeting at us or doing whatever is really helping the situation. And as far as the board culture goes, uh, Madam Secretary, you're welcome. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. All right. Now, uh, Mr. Ford. Yeah, briefly, I'll land by this in the employee support report. Your comments about volunteering, getting volunteers. We've sent that. Sorry, one of the things we discussed with the regional training actually having a track roughly called the care and feeding of volunteers because it's so important for the LNC to take all this energy that's out there in the states and have that energy come forward for positive support to work with us for candidates or any area that people are looking at but at the same time we and state affiliates need to refine our management techniques about affiliates and also learn how to recruit volunteers so we will be focusing on that in the latter part of the term on your ASC. Thank you, Mr. Ford. All right, in closing, thank you all very much for your hard work. Thank you for the financial commitment you've undertaken. Thank you for the time. Um, thank you for being awesome. Let's jump to our vice chair report. Woo. Uh, so <laughs> the uh, main today, that I've been kind of trying to uh, keep going with it has been the uh, the LP tour spaces. And those have been pretty fun. Um, we've done, I think, five, yeah, I'm counting five that we've done the last couple months, I think, since the, uh, our DC meeting. And uh, they've been pretty cool, um, pretty good uh, reception. Um, usually we're getting somewhere between 20 to 50 uh, live attendees, uh, which is cool. Scott Horton had like 200, because he's Scott Horton. Um, so hopefully we can get a little bit more high profile uh, guests soon, maybe Tom or Dave or whoever uh, can pull a decent uh, following. That would be good. Um, the only issue I have is there's been some technical issues. I don't really know how to solve them. Um, but if anybody else might have an idea, that'd be great. Uh, reach out to me. But sometimes people are unable to even hear it. It just depends on the person, um, or they're not able to um, receive co-host or speaker status or whatever. Um, Miss Eiler and Mr. Ford were supposed to help me on a couple of these spaces, and they experienced these, they experienced these issues, and I just I don't know how to fix it. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you, Mr. Watkins. Any questions for Mr. Watkins, our vice chair? Going once, going twice. Hearing none, let's go to our next officer report, which is the treasurer, Mr. Hagopian. Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. 
The the treasurer's report is always the most recent financial report, which is October, which was posted to the business list a few days ago. Uh, cash position has rebounded to 150,000 on the strength of a good revenue month in October. That is two times our cash reserve target. The party is in good shape from a cash management standpoint. From a revenue standpoint, in the month of October, we came in at $182,000, which by far was our best month of the year. That was $174,000 without convention revenue for those who uh, would like that number. That is also broken out in the financial reports every month. Uh, as Madam Chair referenced, uh, when that financial report comes out, you will be able to get that answered uh, accordingly. From an expense standpoint, as we have discussed, one sore spot throughout the year was not spending enough money on fundraising expense and therefore not um, raising enough money. That has been fixed over the past three months. Um, uh, starting in September, you'll see that we have started spending money on fundraising expense and now we are raising money. Um, we are not only spending money to raise money now, but we're spending money to raise money in the future. So October numbers included a $12,500 um, fundraising expense for software uh, that we put in place uh, to do well screening going forward. Um, so from a summary standpoint, cash management, we are in good shape. Fundraising is now on a three month streak as we'll release November numbers. Um, and we are currently spending the appropriate amount on fundraising expense to continue that going into the new year. Uh, obviously, we need to make sure month to month we are not uh, spending more than we're raising because we're walking into ballot access season now. Uh, but I'm feeling very good about where we are right now versus where we were three months ago. Any questions? Any questions for our treasurer? None? Going once, going twice? I'd just like to thank him for all of his hard work. If you don't get criticized unfairly, people don't understand what your role is. You do a very good job of explaining it on the public list and answering criticism in a very professional manner, even though you don't have to. I think the results speak for themselves. Thank you for everything you do. I second that. Okay. Okay. Any other questions for our treasurer? Going once, going twice. Okay. Uh, our next uh, our next officer report is for our secretary. Secretary report. Okay. Thank you. I've got more than I normally do. Uh, so the secretary's report is obviously linked. It's got the, 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 the typical items in it. But this was a delegate allocation month. So that is what I, I, I spent a great deal of time on. And one thing that I, I did just finish, some people have been proofreading it for me, but it will be going out this weekend, is a, a delegate allocation manual but I wanted to stick on the screen if anyone didn't go to the link so this is the sort of data that goes out to the state chairs so it shows the difference in their in their delegates between 2022 and 2024 what their regional percentages are and as you can imagine that th this takes a, a, a bit of work but they did get this by the deadline but even though this report is not done yet, I wanted to give you guys an idea of also what they will be getting. So, didn't give me a page number. Okay, it's, it's nine pages. So they will get a very detailed um, explanation of how these numbers um, came about. But also, I haven't finished these charts yet. They're coming up. I'll, they'll have this chart again broken down. Um, they will have a map. These numbers aren't correct. I got to update them from last year so that they can at a glance see how each state sits without having to. Because some people digest data differently. Some people will like a chart. Some people will like a map. I'll give them a comparison 
all the way back to 2018 of how their delegate numbers went and red and green is purple as they stayed the same. Um, they will also get their platform committee appointments that are coming up for the next convention. Um, so that's one, one item that is going to go out to the states, hopefully, um, this weekend. And they'll also get, and I don't have it on my desktop for some reason. So if you give me a moment, I got to go through my document tree here, which is a, another thing that I've been working on actually having our, our party uh, documents. So where's manuals? So they'll also get a region formation manual. Unfortunately, this is going to appear in Google Docs, which isn't quite as good. And, and here we'll give instructions on forming a region because a lot of newer states just do not understand that. Um, and in here, it'll give the current region formations with the current percentages are so everyone will be able to play around with the percentages. And again, another map showing the percentages for people who view things um, better in that way. So those are the things that I've been really busting tail on this month to try to get us to have um, a, successful, a successful convention. And one other thing I wanted to explain, because we do have new LNC members. Um, for instance, I, I received a few share requests for the potential conflicts of interest, just so that you know every document you might possibly need for this meeting is in the OneNote. So those um, cumulative conflicts of interest are in here. If you want to know the rules you need to follow for executive committee, those are also in here. And if you're wondering, because you can't see the screen, if you want to follow along with my minutes, if you go to the secretarial tab, you'll see there's a link for live notes. And if you hit that, this is where I type out my minutes. You can follow my minutes as I type them right along on your screen. And same thing, we go back to the OneNote. If you're curious how voting is going, we haven't done any voting yet today, but my ballots, you can follow along right on your screen to make sure the votes are correct. So all of those links, all of those documents, are in the OneNote. And also, if you have a question on, say, well, what does the policy manual say on that? Don't go searching on the LP site. I've given you everything you need for this meeting in this OneNote. So I highly encourage everyone to become familiar with this. Because the old LNC, people who've been around a while know, staff used to create binders for everybody that had all this stuff in it. I have them all in storage. And that was such a, a, a waste of paper. So this is the electronic version of what the old LNC used to get. And if you think there's other types of documents that should go in here, let me know and I'll make it a standard part of the OneNote. Okay, I'll, if anyone has any questions. Any questions for our secretary? A very thorough report, which I loved. <coughs> None, going once, going twice. All right, well then that's it. Okay, up next are staff reports. You stand to use for a couple of minutes while I confer with them and get ready. Um, we may have a couple of uh, presentations. All right, everybody. Let's come back to dis-ease. We are missing Mr. Ford and Mr. Hirsch.
we're going to go through, I'm going to give an overview. We're going to jump department by department. You can ask questions. If your question involves going into executive session, I'm going to hold that question. And then if we need to go jump into executive session at the end, which I think we do for like about 10 minutes, we'll do it at the end of staff reports. So they're all together. Does that make sense? All right, great. And uh, it's not my intention that we stay in executive session for a long time, but it, it could be like 10 to 20 minutes. All right, LPHQ staff report. Next slide. Oh, Madam Secretary, can you click through for me? I'm sorry. Yeah. You caught me on Twitter. What are we doing? Who is doing it? Is it working? Why are we doing it? So I will tell you uh, right now, I am filling in as your interim executive director. Do you want to present, maybe? Oh, you. Oh, how do you do that? Slideshow. Okay. Ta -da. I've never. That's okay. You can just click with the arrows. All right. What are we doing? We are. This is what staff, not what the LNC is doing. We're putting on a different hat, right? Through. What are we doing as a party? Setting the vision and then staffs implementing it. So what is the vision, right? We know what we want to be a party of sound economic policy, peaceful foreign policy, individual rights, and this new thing that we are going to be adopting in the next year is being solutions oriented. Next slide. Expression is insane. That was Carrie Eilers' thing. Uh, how are we working to accomplish this vision? PR strategy of Brian McWilliams, offering solutions, saying no to war, being visible in the media, equipping our candidates. Some of the specific initiatives we've been working on. Operation War Buffer Removal, the Deep State, Local Candidates Initiative, um, and Ballot Access. Uh, and of course, fundraising. We have to fundraise to support everyone. Next one. Uh, how are we equipping our candidates? What is staff doing and our affiliates? We're putting together something called LP Masterclass. We've been, uh, we've been working on that very diligently. Online courses to teach our candidates and affiliates how to run campaigns and how to be better candidates. Voter gravity, which everyone's fairly familiar with at this point. Uh, one of our contractors who's not here is going to be rolling out template websites to download. Really high quality professional websites with very forward facing donation pleas. I'm very, very excited about this. And a political director search. So right now we're searching for a part time political director. I've also been filling in on that role. I want to emphasize for people listening, this is a part time role that will be a passion project. And we have to hire someone who's got experience either A, getting someone successfully elected or B, getting an initiative successfully passed. Now, I love everyone. I appreciate all the hard work you put in. But this is not going to be a role that I fill with someone who doesn't have the appropriate experience. And I can't pay you very much. So I know that might sound demoralizing. I don't intend it to sound that way. I just want to be very honest with everyone that we are not going to be filling this role with just anybody. It's going to take a special sort of person who can do this for us. If you want to flood my inbox with your resumes, I, I will I will appreciate it and I will look at them and I will be ever so gracious. But please don't be offended if you're not selected because this is going to, we have to really like find the right fit for this role because we don't want you to be frustrated and burned out, uh, you know, or insulted. And, and we want to get what we need out of it. Uh, let's jump to the next slide. Who are our staff and contractors? We have Luke Troxel, we have Austin Padgett, and we have Matthew Butts in the fundraising department right now. In operations, we have Hannah Kennedy, we have uh, Drew Rhea, we have Matt Thexton, and we have Iris Poole. Some of these are new names. In IT, we have Andy Buckovich, we have Canyon Gargan, and we have David Aiken. Uh, in marketing and graphic design, we have Matthew Hudson and Carrie Eiler. Carrie's a volunteer. Uh, she has done a tremendous job on our LP store. Communications, we have Brian McWilliams. Social media, we have Dylan Allman. And we have me, uh, a volunteer slash slave. Fantastic. Um, next slide. What are we actually doing in each department? You're going to hear from them directly, but as a, with a quick overview, we have lots of email appeals, lots of calls, uh, carefully crafted donation campaigns. Uh, Mr. Padgett has done quite a bit of that. And overall, an increase in activity. 
uh, political impact. We have a lot of activity as well. We are planning a rally right now. We do lots of media quotes. We've gotten op-eds. Voter Gravity falls into that, template websites, and of course our billboard campaign through Operation Warhawk removal. In operations, we've streamlined processes, we've improved documentation. I can't, I can't like emphasize that enough. We've improved departmental oversight too, it's huge right there, uh, customer service an audit of our vendors, understanding how we're spending our money and if it's the right decision, and, and very forward-thinking touch with that department, I love it. Uh, IT, we've got an improved roadmap for our technical future, and we're also working through a backlog of requests for help. And across every department, just in general, we have more staff, and we have a better understanding of what other departments are doing. It's a much more synergistic approach than it was when we came on to the beginning of this term jump to our next slide. Thank you. So what is our internal process? We've invited a lot of you to sit in on some of our staff calls just so that you can sort of see how we operate. We use Scrum. We're very heavy on teamwork. We collaborate. Uh, I personally try to set the tone of mentorship, which means if someone doesn't understand something or they're struggling, we want to teach them and bring them up to speed. We don't want to be uh, harsh in criticism and kicking people to the curb quickly. And uh, we do quarterly reviews. So everybody knows where they're at, they know what they need to improve on, and they also know what they're excelling in. I love our LP staff culture right now. I think it's improved a lot. I think morale is up, and I think we're gonna do great things. And if you haven't ever sat in on a short staff meeting, we have like 15 minute meetings, Tuesday through Thursday in the mornings, you're, you're welcome to sit in on one. Next slide. Major changes in the last quarter. You know, is it working? We have had aggressive fundraising. We have spent a lot more money, and we have hired people. And I believe that yes, this is the way that we should be operating as staff. We got to spend money to make money, and also people seem to be enjoying it. We seem to be getting really good responses from our members. So I'm very excited about that. Next slide. Why are we doing it all right? Sometimes I get uh, critical messages asking, why did you choose this project? Why is staff working on that? You know, anti-war messaging with Operation Warhawk removal and the rallies, like that's straight out of our platform. That, what you're asking me is, why are you talking about the things that you strongly believe in? Because we passionately strongly believe in them. That's why we're doing anti-war. And because we're the only party doing it right now. And we thought that the GOP might be giving us a run for our money on the Ukraine war. But as you can see with the Israeli-Palestine conflict, that is not the case. We got to be the ones to, to carry this banner forward. Local candidate support. Uh, we've, we've got to start small. We've got to build capital. With uh, we've got to build political capital. We've got to build up so so that we have candidates who are going to be competitive in state and federal races. Ballot access has to happen. We have to do that if we want to get our presidential candidate on the ballot. We need to be assisting with ballot access. Um, and most of all, these are the things live. that people are excited about. We're going live, by the way. Oh, sure. Sure. This whole thing is life. Yeah. These are the things that people are excited about, and that's why we do them. Uh, next slide. Oh, there we go. Is that the right one? Yeah. Okay. So I get a lot of questions like, why is that in fundraising? That doesn't sound like it would be in fundraising. Um, because that's what makes people give us money. That's how it works. You do things that people are excited about and passionate about, we consider them fundraising. Ballot access, we fundraise for ballot access. Not everybody in this room is, is passionate and excited about ballot access, but a lot of people are. And by the same token, a lot of people are passionate and excited about anti-war um, messaging and activity. So let's jump to our next slide. We have had some challenges. Have we had challenges? Absolutely. Uh, we'll hear maybe from staff about technical debt. There have been some poor decisions. Garbage people, they're very mad at us sometimes. Uh, we've had internal conflicts. And as of every year, you know, it's the most important election in our lifetime, and it always will be. But I think that we are gonna overcome all of these challenges. Next slide. I think we're gonna do it through persistence and creativity and from having awesome staff. So thank you guys, uh, next slide. Sneak preview. I'm gonna be trying to get staff to reach $148,000 a month every month next year, we'll see. We want to acquire a new CRM. We're gonna to continue to refine our marketing and uh, pitches and also do some uh, segmentation if we get a new we get a new CRM. 
I would love us to do demographics research, and I have a couple of people who have expressed uh, interest in helping us do that. We want to learn how to better utilize our IT resources, including our, our, our staff members, and we are going to get out those membership cards, because I know everybody wants them. So those are our goals. Thank you all so much. We are going to hear from staff now, but before we do, do you have any qu questions for me? Yes. On the thing where you had the, the cute little girl asking the question, yes. um, because it, something has come up, and I, and I think it's a really good thing to, to bring up and wanted your thoughts on it. Um, there's a lot of questions on how things are categorized. Yep. But for instance, another big one, like the one you had mentioned is, why is the Historical Preservation Committee under activism and outreach? That's the other big question that comes up. I know I have thoughts on it, but I'd be curious as to yours. I don't have strong feelings on how things are categorized. For me, as a person who has to just like push the money right. around, you know, I just need it to fall in and for it to be, and to make some sense. It doesn't have to be perfect. But, I mean, I wouldn't put historical preservation in IT, you know? Right. It's, it's either going to be those sort of things, it's going to be fundraiser, or it's going to be outreach and activism. And I can tell you why. I think act activism and outreach is appropriate, because what many people might not know, reporters now are more and more going to look at the Lpedia pages, because we monitor where our hits are coming from and how many hits, and like this month, this page got a lot, and we're finding out it's because it's in the news cycle, and, and, and the intent, at least, of that project is, in fact, outreach for well, people. Well, it is. I mean, it's, it's, it's political. Yeah. It's so political. I, was just, I was just curious, because sure. the one example you mentioned is one I hear quite a bit, and the other one was the second one that I heard. Mr. Agopian. Yeah, just uh, to touch on that, <clears throat> the, those subcategories that get um, paid for, like ballot access and historical preservation, they're not in outreach and activism, they're in core services. Okay. Outreach and activism has its own GL line, uh, so core services is basically everything um, that we do project-based work on, and so that's, if anyone asks that question, it's a core service, it's not outreach and activism. Thank you. Any other questions before I turn it over? Yep, Mr. Better. Yeah, Madam Chair, I noticed at one point you were talking about uh, templates for candidates to use. I was just curious, do you happen to know, are those for WordPress? Yes, okay. we have a WordPress template. We have had requests for a Nation Builder template, and staff has told me that it's going to take more time, but my hope is that we'll get that at least by March when campaign season is, is like really underway. All right. If there's no other questions, I believe we're going to start with fundraising and Mr. Troxel. Awesome. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. You can pull mine down. Can you have the report? Do you want me to put uh, yours up? Yeah, just so it's a lot easier than me just reading off the numbers off the top of the, top of the head. So. Would it be this one? Yes. That okay. Would be correct. All right. So, hey, everybody. Uh, Luke Troxel fundraising director. Uh, wanted to go over our numbers, make sure that everybody is very clear about how things are going. So uh, I wanted to do a quick overview. Uh, the period that we just went through, uh, so September through November, uh, we raised $380,000 uh, compared to, if you scroll down slightly here, oh no, it's actually right there. Uh, compared to the previous quarter, which is uh, $250,000. So we made a pretty significant jump in our fundraising efforts, um, in large part thanks to bringing on, uh, you know, lost the pageant, as well as the uh, upgrade of our software, the capabilities, which I'll touch on a little bit later. Um, we launched a new merch store. We uh, implemented physical mail, and, uh, you know, we were able to utilize some connections that Mr. Pageant had in order to bring in a uh, max out donation in October, which were pretty significant gains, although, as you can see, that doesn't cover the entire spread. So uh, our efforts are doing quite well. And uh, this even in reflection to the comparative quarter, which is uh, Q4 of 2019, uh, using the same comparative months, 
Uh, they only raised $379,000 in Q4 2019, which is the same place in the election cycle which is where we're currently at. And so uh, we actually ended up uh, outraising that quarter. So we, in all, all aspects, are doing uh, better than we were last quarter and better than we were at the same point in 2019. So uh, things are improving significantly. Uh, we implemented physical mail because the thing is that in a review of the numbers, it just didn't make sense why we weren't sending out physical mail. Uh, they, you know, the numbers were either breaking even or making two to three times as much as what we were whenever we were doing it. And so, you know, whenever I was uh, brought back on in uh, late August, we were able to, you know, get that spun back up and uh, rolling. So we also increased our uh, email appeals. We in Q3 we only sent out 17 fundraising email appeals. Uh, in Q4, we sent out 43, uh, so a pretty significant jump. Uh, and we've only had one complaint about getting too many emails. So, you know, that's uh, pretty awesome. We, we see that that's transmitted over into additional donor revenue. Uh, and, and for Q4, uh, we raised $26,500 for ballot access specifically. So I know ballot access has been a bit of a, uh, you know, contentious subject as of late. So I wanted to make sure we include that. Karen, you can just roll Yep, up. one moment. So I want to just give a quick breakdown because I'm sure you guys are going to have questions about, you know, what are we doing? What's bringing in the money? Uh, we ran one mailer in September, you know, that brought in $13,550. Uh, uh, email appeals, 10. As I said, I'm not going to read all these numbers because you can see them up here on the screen. Uh, and our total revenue was $98,000. Uh, didn't quite hit $100,000. Uh, actually, I'm not positive that the number is perfectly correct because it may not include uh, store numbers, but uh, we'll use that for now. $98,000. If you go down to October, uh, this is where we make a really big jump. Uh, you know, we ran another mailer, and uh, the mailer rev revenue went up to 13,000. Uh, we set up 18 fundraising appeals, and we ended up raising $182,000. Uh, and as I said, 41,000 was up from a major donate donor, which means we still brought in $141,000 through membership revenue, through ballot access appeals, through you know attempts to re-engage people that had not been communicated with because their primary method of communication is through physical mail. That's how they've sent us money in the past, and they hadn't sent us money some, in some cases since 2018. So we re-engaged donors that were not engaged previously. Go ahead and scroll down here now. And in November, we ran two mailers. Um, and the idea here is, is that the strategy we would ideally like to be utilizing is we're sending out every month a renewal, e a renewal mailer to make sure that everyone who is going to be expiring that upcoming month is getting a mailer, as well as a topical mailer revolving around three core issues. Um, affiliate support, candidate support, and ballot access. So those are the three core issues that we want to make sure that we're rotating, making sure that people are getting engaged, know what's going on. Uh, because, as I said, some people are not engaging with the party on through digital email. We need to communicate through them to them through physical mailers, and that's how we're going to make sure to continue to keep those people engaged. And oftentimes, you'd think that if we send a physical mailer to somebody, you know. Uh, once every three months, that may be too often, but these people oftentimes, every time we send them a mailer, they donate. Um, and then I'll break down the mailer process because I'm sure people do have questions about like, hey, how much did it cost? How much did it end up making? Because, you know, revenue is not the only important part. Cost is definitely an important uh, part of this process. So uh, in September, we ended up sending out 5,000, uh, 5,500 mailers. We uh, received 125 donations. Uh, the revenue was $16,206, and it cost us 5,127. So our ROI on that mailer was 316%, which is, you know, I think Todd's put out before, he'd like to see a four to one uh, cost to uh, revenue association. So I wanna make sure that we try to hit that as often as possible. But you know, 316% for our first mailer, which is a uh, very wide uh, September ballot access mailer, uh, brought us in quite a bit of money. Go ahead and uh, scroll down a little bit, Karen. Uh, so October was we hadn't sent out physical mailers in almost a year to send out renewals. And the thing is, is that uh, 
that is obviously a clear oversight on uh, our part because we sent out 7,500 mailers, we got almost 500 donations, and it made us $30,000 because we just mailed everyone who had, who had fallen off over the past year. And a lot of those people, when looking at their, their donations, had only contributed via physical mail. So those were donations we were never going to get again if we didn't send out those physical mailers. And it only cost us $5,700, so we made a pretty penny on that, 532% ROI. Um, and then if you scroll down a little bit more, Karen Ann, uh, we sent out two in November. These are still running. We are still getting donations, so these numbers look a lot smaller. But they're continuing to come in every day as, as we uh, tack them in. And big thanks to Matt Dexton for putting these in for us. Um, we sent out in November, and this is probably going to be more reflective of what we see going forward. It's about 1,000 uh, mailers are going to get sent out per month. Uh, you know, the problem with smaller mailer sizes, as you can see, is that the cost is a lot closer to the actual number compared to when we do the much larger mailer sizes, we get a big, we get significant cost savings. So uh, that's something that we're going to look into and that, you know, we may start utilizing that on a quarterly basis instead of a monthly basis. That's a decision that we're going to be taking a look at in the future. Um, and so, you know, it cost us $953. We sent out 984 mailers and we've already brought in for the November mailer uh, uh, 285% ROI, 17,000 net. So, um, and then the candidate support mailer, we wanted to make sure that, as I said, we're hitting that subject. And uh, the next one is going to be, which should be hitting people's uh, mailboxes in the next week or so, is going to be, uh, you know, charitable giving. So in December, it's always a great way for us to raise money, even though that we're not a nonprofit and tax deductible. People want to give in December. And so we're sending out uh, a mailer to all, everyone who's given significant donations to the party to ask them to, you know, open up their wallets and if they have the capability to do so, give as much as possible up to the maximum donation of $41,300 uh, because that's a calendar year donation, not a rolling donation. So on January 1, they can start their donations up again. So if they haven't hit that max out and they want to, I highly encourage anybody who's watching this to go to lb.org slash donate or lb.org slash join and make a donation up to $41,300 uh, to get that maximum contribution in before the end of the year. So. Um, the one thing that isn't up here on the slides, and it's because we just rolled out a new software, is our call numbers, and that is because we just got uh, a new software program, program called Kixi. It is a extremely powerful tool that, in the short time that we used it, um, which you know we only got it a week ago, uh, it's enabled. I want to say, I think I made 150 calls in two days. And that was towards the time crunch that we were uh, we were trying to make those last uh, those last few dollars come in for November, and it paid for itself within the first hour. And to talk about how it works, you know, it's a program where we are able to upload a list, hit go, assign it to one of the three people who are making phone calls, and whenever they start up the program, it just starts dialing and. If they don't answer, we can drop a voicemail and move on. It takes 30 seconds per call. And that is a significant improvement over our previous system, which is to work off of a spreadsheet and or try and utilize Civi, which I'm not even going to touch. I'll let Andy talk about that. Um, you know, which was a significant time lag, you know, that's taking up to two minutes per phone call. So a pretty significant improvement. And uh, we were able to, in the last couple of days, secure almost $4,000 from phone call donations uh, in the last two days. So um, I will open things up to the floor. Does anyone have any questions? Talk. Uh, I can ask a number of questions offline with you and Hannah, but one question I have is, like let's say the September uh, numbers, for example, if you uh, send out the mailer in September and they uh, donate in October or November, are you capturing that? Yes, so uh, I go back and periodically review the mailers that have come in. So you'll see that um, last contribution date yeah. received, 11-28, that's, yeah. I do that for each one. And I, I do have a appeals yeah. spreadsheet that I will be sharing with you okay. um, separately that has the breakdown of all of our email appeals and all of our mailer appeals yeah. and, and their exact amount of sent out, receive rate, open rate, 
hold them. I was basically asking because I anticipate the November ROI to rise. Yes, so it should go up pretty significantly. In December, so I just want to make sure people realize like November probably will have the similar ROI. It's just over yes. time. And then I'll, I'll deal with the rest of the questions for you, but I like how you guys are tracking it. This is going to help us decide how much to yeah. spend on this going forward. It's all about data. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Uh, Mr. Malgon, and Mr. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. What can we expect in terms of physical mailers and emails there in 2024 compared to 2023? Like an increase, decrease, about the same? And like, whether it be by the year or by the quarter, what's the plan? Yeah, Q4 should be reflective of what we will be doing in 2024. Um, you know, with with the you know help of Angela Gardle and being able to uh, you know have creative control over the process. It's it's been. Um, let's just say an aggressive push forward to try and reach out to people, contact them. You know, um, my previous roles uh, in, in, in fundraising and, and have been in a commission basis. And so the thing is, is that what I've learned is, is never be shy to make the ask and ask frequently because it typically takes seven touches in order to be able to um, close the deal. And so if we're not sending out frequent communication, if we're not communicating through every avenue that we have, then we're gonna miss someone. And the thing is, is that it's all a numbers game. If the math makes sense, we should be doing it. If it makes sense for us to hire on seven more people to make phone calls, if the math makes sense, if we're going to be able to get that money in and to cover those costs and see significant you know, revenue in, in comparison to that, that is what's important. That's what should drive our fundraising efforts, not, you know, is this, a, is this, you know, should we hire somebody or should, should we not? Or should we send out 17 emails or should we send out five emails? It's all just a matter of does the math make sense? And the high communication levels have reflected that we should be continuing to do that. Uh, we are looking at uh, if we do end up uh, making some investments in our, you know, technological improvements, then we do have the ability to send out much more sophisticated mailers. We do also, thank you for asking this, because uh, I just remembered, we do uh, run A-B testing right now through our, through our emails and through our mailers, so we are able to see um, which demographics that we are targeting for specifically our physical mailers we have them designated, so uh, we are capturing that data as well. And uh, Mr. Ford and then Mr. Marco. When the well, what's the channel next year to get issue-specific asks and to a Fourth Amendment criminal justice reform from or anyone about yeah. under priority? And, and how will you define what order and where we've got the most potential? So we already capture in our when people someone makes a donation, we already capture whether what issues they're most important to them. Um, we are going to be refining that process because I think that uh, right now it only allows you to check three boxes and it doesn't it doesn't have you rank them. So um, that may that is we're considering putting out additional surveys to capture that data and upload that into the CR, whatever CRM we end up using. Um, and the difficult, not impossible, but difficult to gather that information and send it out. Uh, but to the second part of your question. Um, which is, you know, how are we going to set priorities around that? Um, it, it, we're going to take a look at the data that currently exists and see if there have been any mailers or emails that have brought in uh, significant revenue for those issues. We find that broader subjects, as I showed you here, um, you know, if we send out a 900 person mailer, it's going to cost us about $950. If we send out a 5,000 person mailer, it's only going to cost us $3,500. So what we would like to do is target broader subjects rather than narrow subjects. But um, for our email appeals and things along those lines, yes, um, we're going to be using that in congruency with the whoever the presidential nominee is uh, to use market timing to maximize people's impact. Whenever you know, if whoever our nominee in, ends up being, will be if they have a particularly viral topic, we'll be sending out a mailer or an email about that. So. The Kixi, K-I-X-I-E, it's a, it's a call software. And it's very powerful, and I encourage any of our affiliates to get it if you have a dedicated caller. Um, for the full the full suite, uh, it's $150 a person. Um, right now, we're only paying that for Matthew Butts, uh, who is doing an awesome job making phone calls every single day, uh, you know, every single work day, and getting people to, you know, 
show up, solve, solving their problems, uh, taking customer service calls, and uh, renewing donors. So uh, I highly encourage you to do that. Um, Austin and I are only $90 a month because we don't have to have as many capabilities as Matthew Butts does because um, the variance of our jobs. But uh, that's a great question. Thanks. Well, look, real quick, is there any way to strike some sort of national agreement? It's possible. Uh, I, it, that's something we'd have to discuss with the QC program, uh, exactly. see if they could provide any discount. But they are amenable to making variable costs. Uh, Mr. Gobian and then uh, Opal. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, go ahead, Mr. I, uh, yeah, so I just want to touch on a couple of things Mr. Drexel said uh, and Mr. Malcolm's comment. So, um, the whole idea behind stripping away uh, the mailers originally was to build them back up with purpose, and now we've got that purpose. So they're doing A/B they testing. They've got some more software. They decide who to send it to and when to send it to and how uh, different topics are working. And so I would be fine tripling the amount of money we're spending on mailers if we have targeting, you know, targeted mailers, uh, which we didn't have before. So already we're doing a better job. Uh, going forward, I would be fine doing way more if it proves out, which it seems like it is. Yeah. And then another uh, topic on that is 5,000 versus 900, you're absolutely right, it gets cheaper per mailer, but the more specified the ask is, the more money you get back. So you've got to balance that with how can I spend or <coughs> 5,000 with a very specified ask. So the only thing I would put out to you, uh, Luke, to think about is, uh, recently, there was a ballot access meeting on a very specific state and a very specific ask, not LNC related, outside the LNC, and they raised over $20,000 in one meeting. Uh, and you guys raised 20000 in like one big mailer. Mm -hmm. The reason I bring that up is because as you do ballot access going the next four or five months out, the more specified you can make that request and the more urgent you can make that request. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people out there that will put money towards ballot access, but we do have to be uh, very specified. This was like this day, this deadline, this much money, mm -hmm. and that people were willing to. Yeah, specific asks them. typically yeah. overperform compared to general yeah. asks. And that's the other thing I'll say is that uh, uh, ballot access has historically been much larger donations and probably uh, it's a good call first email yes in a lot of scenarios yeah no and that that was the list that i was working uh previously before we came up and we were that's where a lot of that money came in uh right at the end of this month was specifically donors who did that and, and to touch on another thing that he said i do want to uh echo what mr grovian said um there were in the past um some of the policies regarding like uh sending out physical mailers i mean they sometimes I, I believe that we were sending up to six mailers to the same person, um, trying to get them to renew. And you know, as as you can see, it costs you know a dollar or less per mailer. But if this is a twenty-five dollar renewal, you know the cost goes up significantly as you send out additional uh, mailers. That may be something we explore in the future. But I, what I wanted to make sure is that our targeted uh, revenue, your targeted goals for these mailers, was to maximize our revenue. Um, we may. Uh, explore that option in the future, but my focus is not having mailers that make no money. That's my most important factor. Ms. Ms. Carlos, and then I get to Mr. Bernard. Um, yeah, I can get you some examples of ones that were done. Now, we're talking probably 25 years ago, so oh. I have these old mailers, but there was one that we did, and I, I can't tell you how successful it was, sure. so it could have bombed. I just know that when I read it, I was like, that is clever. And what they did is they were tar targeting gun rights groups that weren't libertarian. And they led the mailer with, we know you're, you think we're crazy and you're not gonna vote for our candidates. However, we're crazy like a fox for the issue you care about. And if you donate to us, we could make your candidates move in a direction that cares about your issue. So it was acknowledging that there's people out there who think our drug policy is nuts, but love our gun policy. Mm -hmm. And that we can position ourselves as a pivot point. This was a very moderate LNC that sent this out. They weren't Republican plants sure. by any, wow. any stretch. Now that could have bombed, but I thought that was a very clever idea. No, I like and, and I could get you a copy of it and you all do what you want with it, but I can get you some copies of some, what I thought were some really good before email. Mm -hmm. So all they ever did. 
so they got really good at sending out mailers and some of them were very clever well it should be documented in Zivi, so if i can get the appeal code that'll help me find out whether it was successful or not this is pre oh, this okay. is when membership cards mark montoni will tell you we're on index cards <laughs> okay got like it. on rolodexes we're taught we're talking a way well we'll see if we can find it but if yeah. not i'd love to see the mailer regardless that'd be fantastic and um you actually completely sparked another thought in my head, which is we did uh, recently get the Aristotle data that we purchased, and that's going to be a very big bump in Dece December. So uh, very excited. Uh, if, if I remember correctly, uh, and Mr. Bukovic can correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's on, I, I believe we acquired 15,000 new contacts. So we're going to be uh, contacting those people to ask them to join the party and uh, to become donors. So that's really exciting uh, getting that. Uh, these are registered libertarians. These are not just random contacts. These are people who want to vote libertarian or registered libertarian. So we're going to be reaching out to those people very soon. Um, Mr. Benner. Yeah, real quick question, Mr. Traxel. I know that the website form for when people sign up to become a member has a free form text box at the end. I'm just wondering if you're willing to tell us or you have a grasp of what's the most common thing people generally write in that box. Uh, Drew would probably be more familiar with that than I would. Uh, it's simply because yeah. he does get the commentary, and Angela gets the commentary I, I, as well. I am a numbers guy. I, I you know, I'm not, I don't often review the comments on there, uh, but Angela gets all of those. So, uh, Angela, do you have any? It's, I mean, you get everything from just like really generic. The two-party system has to go to very specific things about gun rights, um, regulations. It's pretty varied across the board. I mean, maybe the generic two-party system has to go, might, might win out by a very thin margin of error. Yeah, and, and if I remember, because I used to get those emails and then now they get forward to Angela, uh, but uh, if I remember correctly, they're overwhelmingly positive. There's, you know, obviously they're giving us money, um, so, you know, it's very, it's very rare that people hate donate, uh, but, um, you know, most of the time it's, you know, I, I left I left the two party system. Things that you know I can't you know I want to support the cause. They have sometimes they have specific issues that they're talking about, but it's mostly generic you know appeals to the Libertarian Party's principles. It's the most common uh, donation, donation commentary. So uh, yeah, that's. Uh, is there any other questions that we want to go over? Any? Thank you, Mr. Troxel. Um, one thing on on mail, direct mail, you know, staff had communicated to me before that they didn't really decide to just cut off direct mail, that they felt like they'd lost the ability to. And I think we can really dig in on some questions on that, probably in executive session, because some of it's gonna have to do with staff. Yeah. But just keep that in the, in the back of your mind. For sure. Well, thank you so much for everyone's time, and uh, I'll pass that. Thank you, we're gonna hear a brief update from Mr. Padgett to round out fundraising and then we're gonna to jump to operations. Hello. So yes, <laughs> we've had some good uh, fundraising months. Uh, I think November would have been a bit higher if we had the Aristotle data in earlier. It took longer than uh, anyone could have imagined and then longer than that again. Um, uh, we ended up making it through uh, the top two categories of donors for membership. Um, so we had to resort to kind of a third, less lucrative category through the second half of the month. Uh, but with the registered member data, there's gonna be way, way more than uh, we can eat, so that'll be good. Um, the call software has been great. The whole team's kind of up to speed and using it and worked out the kinks. Uh, we'll be able to increase our numbers a lot of that, leave autom automatic uh, voicemails, so uh, that takes that saves a lot of time and also energy, because if you're leaving a voicemail every time you call, by the time someone picks up, you're just about done talking anyways. Um, uh, people have been really receptive to uh, various pitches. Um, that have numbers attached to them and defined outcomes. Uh, that's been demonstrated uh, with the the voter gravity uh, has been has been great because that's something we're actually delivering already, and it really it really does make a huge impact. 
combining that with high quality automated candidate websites is is no joke. It would really, really revolutionize the potential for libertarians to get elected throughout the whole country. And we have a responsibility to organize the libertarian movement, which if we are all as right as we think we are, it's going to be big. And if and it has to go through us because of our position, our name, uh, our, what we represent. And if we're not really organizing that movement, uh, we're, we're advocating a big responsibility and people are gonna look at that historically if we are, if we are correct about our idea of winning out. So I would just uh, urge everyone to remember how important this all is and uh, focus on delivering things that are tangible uh, and help people and get uh, all our members and everybody who doesn't, who thinks they're a member but is just a registered voter uh, motivated and sees the party as something that's advancing the cause of liberty and sees it as so worthwhile that they feel guilt when they're not a paying member. Um, so that, that would be a good goal going forward. Uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions, let me know. How does that automated voicemail work? You record, you can pre-record different voicemails, and then at the end of the call, when the message, when the person starts talking, hey, leave me a voicemail before it beeps, you just drop whatever voicemail you want to send them. So that can be cur curated to things people care about. Um, the call software has notes section for CRM notes and, and non-platform notes. Once we get a uh, CRM that can connect to it, which HubSpot can, uh, it's really, really going to revolutionize our ability to target people with calls and specific messages. Um, because we can have that all categorized and automatically generate lists and then assign lists. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a game changer and it's something we absolutely need to have as an organization. So are you still here, still dialing the phone? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. I thought it was going right to the voicemail. Do they have that feature? Uh, no, no. Um, we want we want to dial first because we want people to yeah. pick up the the direct voicemail drop. I think there's some legal issues yeah. with it that have been getting increasingly difficult to maneuver. Um, and yeah, yeah. so. Yeah, we've, we've got the, the, the direct calling. And the more we do this, um, the other thing we do on every call is when we connect with someone, uh, we say, hey, now you're connected to the party. You have a direct line to the party. If you have questions, if you just have concerns, you talk to me, you know, uh, and we can address it. So then, then they have buy-in, and then it's like a real service. So even if they're not buying your particular issue, that's an underlying reason to donate. Um, they feel like they have a, a mouthpiece to talk into uh, to get themselves heard. So it's really important to have this engagement with, with our members um, and everybody else. Uh, and with the new data, data, hopefully it should continue to uh, reap increasing rewards, not just status quo. Adrian has a question. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, so the treasurer asked one of my questions. Uh, the other question I had was, uh, how did the Kixie thing come about? So was there some sort of comparison shopping? What was the... What yeah, there was the comparison shopping. Um, most of the softwares the uh, had minimums for five-person teams. Um, Kixie oh, was, was the cheapest that. one, uh, oh, and it was also recommended to me by other uh, software providers when they heard kind of what we needed and what our budget constraints were. Uh, Kixie was was the five person team community what exactly sorry um, minimum <coughs> five person accounts so okay. these are like software designed for big sales teams uh, Kixie gave us the the functions that we needed and it's also really easy to use simple it's not over complicated and it connects to to HubSpot and we don't we don't need as many features as a uh, sales team we're not uh, we're not calling them back or checking in as frequently as, as a sales team would. But we do have the ability after every call, you can say, 
what date you want to call them back. Um, oh, like a reminder comes up. Yeah, yeah. And that like, and you do that with some people, but not not everybody like right. you would with, with a sales job. All right. Any more questions for Mr. Padgett? Okay. Thank you. All right, if there's none, thank you very much to our fundraising department. Let's kick it over to our operations director, Hannah Kennedy. I'm just going to borrow your chair. That's out of order. It's already done. Okay. Good morning, everybody. It's been very nice to meet you all in person. I know I've dealt with uh, quite a few of you already, and um, it's been a lovely experience across the board. So. Thank you for that. Um, I was brought on in October and I came in at, I think, pretty much an ideal time, which was we were coming out of a free fall off a cliff. Um, and thankfully we were being saved by some difficult decisions being made by the chair. Uh, but essentially we are, as an organization, entirely people dependent on staff. That means that the LNC is held hostage by the things that the staff can do, and that's not ideal. Ideally, I could be replaced tomorrow uh, with someone who would come in, all my processes would be documented, uh, there would be a repository of information available to them so they could read through and go, okay, this is exactly what I need to do, these are the bills that need to be paid, um, you know, these are the filings that need to happen. And as it stands right now, that's not the case. And I'm not, I'm very much interested uh, coming from a business background in having the LNC function like a business and not like a club. Um, we're not volunteers, we are paid staff and we can build something very professional. So the first step of that has been um, getting out of that recall, so stopping the bleeding. We are almost out of that, mostly with our finances in terms of you know, do we have access to all of the bills, that, you know, our logins so that we can pay our bills? Um, are we filing all the tax reports that we need to file on time? Those kinds of things. We're not being charged unnecessary fees. Um, you know, we're not being dropped by our vendors. That is really, like, when you talk about critical function, that's the most critical. And we are about this close, thanks to um, our accounting firm from being out of that. Um, and then the second step of the process is to audit our current processes, all of them, because none of them are working as efficiently as they should. Uh, donor time is, or excuse me, donor money is uh, not being put to its best use if staff is forced to perform inefficient function. Every hour of staff time is donor dollars. So in terms of our membership, that's the bad news, but the good news is we're gonna fix it. Um, in terms of membership, we actually saw the first tick up in membership since October of 2021. Obviously that corresponded with the October right before the last convention, so that makes sense. We were still in a decline prior to that, um, so it was just a short, hopefully this time we can turn that around and actually bring our membership numbers up. And we, you know, hopefully we've bottomed out. So, and then uh, as Mr. Hagopian said, that our reserve is very healthy right now. Um, in my written report, apparently our target is 75,000, not 50,000, so I got that wrong. We are at two times, not three times. Now, we are currently having a problem with Authorize.net. Uh, that is one of our payment processors for all of our ACH transactions. So one of the, this was actually just brought to our attention this week, and so we've kind of been scrambling to figure out um, how we solve this. The issue is that Authorize processes our payments, the payments complete successfully, which is good news because that means it's transparent to the donor. As far as they can see from their end when they go to their bank account, uh, the payment has gone through. The problem is that authorize.net is not communicating that completed payment to SIBI. In SIBI, it shows that the payment is pending. Now, the reason that that's an issue is because when you have a pending payment, you don't count as a member. And so it, it became very necessary that we find a workaround for that in order to get our membership report completed and thanks to Andy, we're, we were actually able to do that. Um, but now we still have the problem of, they all say pending. Now we've looked back historically, there's over 400 transactions in SIBI that still say pending. There's no way technically, or rather, 
our it staff does not have the time compared to other critical functions to go in and fix that at the moment and so our temporary fix is going to be taking uh, a couple of our operations staff they're going to have to manually go in um, to civi and uh, look up the transactions in authorize and then change the status in civi and they will have to spend hours and hours and hours doing that because civi this is a fun fact about civi every navigation click in civi corresponds to a six second delay that's longer for searches that means staff can perform a maximum of 10 clicks per minute assuming staff spends a combined total of 20 hours a day on the platform making five clicks a minute that means 10 hours of that 20 are spent waiting for an action to execute in financial terms that means based on the average employee pay per hour the party is spending 312 dollars a day excluding taxes benefits and other employment related costs waiting for an action to execute in city that's the depth of the problem that exists say that one more time the whole thing is 312. oh <laughs> Um, so that means that, that in fiscal terms, based on the average employee pay per hour, the party is spending $312 a day, excluding taxes, benefits, and employment-related costs, waiting for an action to execute in city. Okay, one that sink in. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, that means that that's now time that now needs to go and reconcile those 400 plus transactions. Um, we're going to be we're going to be paying staff to sit there and wait for the little Sydney wheel to finish. Uh, in terms of our infrastructure, so again, we are I, I am primarily concerned with enduring systems because this is a political environment, and so staff turnover is always going to be high. Um, we are encouraging specialization of labor, so I think the party tends to suffer from a mentality of I can do it myself. Um, which is a chronic problem among the self-employed, and it leads to, you know, two primary outcomes. Either uh, things are done without regard to cost and efficiency, or things are not done to a high standard. Um, and I think that we have a little bit of both right now going on, and I don't need to explain the danger of the people-dependent system because the LNC has experienced this year, experienced it this year with the uh, departure of the prior oper operations director. Uh, that's not, at that point when you need someone to make sure that you are not exposing yourself to massive amounts of liability, that's not employment, that's a hostage situation. So I'm interested very much in getting the party out of that situation so that when I depart, um, we don't have, we don't ever suffer from that again. And the key to that is documentation and standardization of processes. So to that end, we've also uh, finished our migration in, uh, into Paychex, which is our now handles our time and attendance, our HR policy, um, and our payroll processing. So what's wonderful is they're experts at what they do, and I give them information that I have about staff, and they take it from there and they make sure that we are in compliance. We're in the process also of moving our 401k program because we've purchased a, a suite essentially of their services, we get a significant discount for the services that they do provide us, which is wonderful. So when we made the switch uh, from Vanguard to Paychex, we are saving um, a little over $1,800 over the next year just on that switch, same services, actually an expanded basket of funds available for our staff to choose from. We went from Vanguard's, you know, 50 to Paychex's 9,000. So, very nice move and all. Um, they also handle all of our uh, disclosures for any staff-related changes, any compliance-related staff things um, for the 401k, payroll, et cetera, so we will never miss one of those um, and then be under fire about it. And also, I think it reduces the ambiguity there's a lot of employment ambiguity, particularly, you know, not having a big policy manual and so forth. And I think that exposes the LNC and staff um, to uh, liability or um, mistreatment, again, on both ends. So I think implementing out these outside firms has really been helpful. I would say the same for Veracity Probes. They have, um, I know they're, I know you look at the budget line and they ask, like, how can they possibly be worth it? I can absolutely assure you, based on personally seeing 
what was left um, after the last operations director uh, departed that they are a thousand percent necessary. What they have done is save us from uh, a lot of potential liability. So going forward, um, and that means that, again, that takes me out of the picture entirely. So if I leave tomorrow, if another operations director comes in, accounting can then tell the new operations director, you know, this is these are this is what's going on, this is the information I need from you, and then that operations director can go, okay, I'll go get that. And then everything functions. We still pay people, we still pay our bills, we still uh, file our taxes. So one of the things that we have started when we moved to the new store was uh, remitting sales tax. So all of the portals needed to be created in the various states in which we are responsible for remitting sales tax. Uh, that's something that I have been doing in priority because as we have filed, we will now get late fees if we don't do that quickly. So there have been some hiccups with access, but that's been a top priority for me. That also means that we no longer have to pay sales tax on our purchases from our vendor. So when we purchase from Printful, they do not charge us sales tax, which increases the margins on our store a little bit in those particular states. Also, there is a an excessive amount of waste, I think, uh, in our budget, not in the budget, in the actual expenditures, um, because the processes and the, the services and the contractors that we're using, they have not been on the properly. Um, so one of the things I did the first month I was in is I went to every department and I had them sit down with me and I looked at every single vendor that we were using under that department and I said, do you still need this? Do you need it at this level? What services specifically are you, you using here? Do we have a cheaper option? Um, and we were able to, over the next year, like if we, if we stop all the payments that we're making, you know, on unnecessary things, we will save about $44,000 so far process is not completed. So it's worth doing. Um, I have also assumed responsibility over the release of membership reports. So that type of graphical error you guys caught in September, that was my fault. Sorry about that. Uh, won't happen again. And um, I do want to stress that I can't get that done without Andy. So the reports that are needed to pull membership data can only be performed right now by Andy. If Andy gets hit by a bus, I don't know what the party's going to do. So that is a that is a bottleneck that exists not just in the membership reports, but in almost every aspect of operation. So in terms of the workforce, there's been one new person <coughs> besides myself, um, and that's Canyon. Uh, Canyon Morgan has been an absolute delight to bring on board. He's been dedicated really to the migration from Google Drive uh, over to Microsoft. And we are spending about $15,000 a year on a duplicated service, which is Google and Microsoft. So the sooner we can get off of Google, the better. Hopefully, I think you believe the target is by the end of the year. So I pray that that giant Google expense is not going to go on the books in January. Um, we've also, well, excuse me, this is not done, this is in process. We're trying to standardize the onboarding process. Uh, right now, there is not a training system, there is not a procedure manual uh, to provide any sort of necessary access to the tools that you'll use in your job function. There's no explanation of these tools or any uh, of the initiatives or jargon that's currently happening. Essentially, what you have to do when you come on as staff, you sit in the meetings, you don't know what anything means, and then occasionally, when someone realizes you don't know what's going on, you like, they're like, oh, you haven't been added to this, or you need access to this. And that's not efficient, because then you don't get to give a, an employee a complete picture of um, the tools they need to do their job. So I'm working with Andy to make sure that we have every department when a new employee is brought on board, uh, that department, so Andy's department will be responsible for giving them access to all of the um, technical tools that they need, inviting them to city and so forth. I will make sure that they have access to things like paychecks, they're uh, enrolled in their benefits, um, and any sort of like logins or anything like that uh, that they need to perform their job functions is not only there, but also explained. 
So we can actually sit down, have a meeting, and say, hey, this is what's going on, this is the procedure, do you have questions? So something that the, the test was being used prior to me being brought on was it uh, with APR, which are DevOps, DevOps, and Microsoft Teams. Um, I think that's fantastic. They sync very well. And um, we, I believe that we could utilize them much more effectively. And so that will be something that I work on over the next six months to try to synchronize our work um, a lot better and reduce the need for excess communication or delay and getting things done. Because oftentimes, with such a small team, you're going to be waiting on other people a lot, and so we want to highlight when tasks are, you know, being waited on, and then be able to resolve those with priority. So, customer service was one of the first things that Angela said was a priority when I was brought on. That was her one in her big four list of things that she really wanted operations to to do and fix and to, you know do better. And to her credit, she you know, was, was well underway riding the ship with that. And I think that now we have fine-tuned it with the help of Drew and Ira significantly. Um, so Drew has developed a robust library of training for all things that come into Info Inbox. So that's our general inbox for member questions. And he has pretty much everything covered and was able to relay that to Iris. So now she's able to do basically everything he's able to do which is great because if they both get hit by a bus tomorrow, somebody can still uh, clear out the info inbox. Um, we have also implemented a customer service tracker, which I think is very cool. I nerd out on this like daily. This was just last week. So operations needs metrics in order to determine how we're doing. And right now there aren't any historic metrics for us to go off of. Um, that are purely operational. We have, obviously, we've got the reserve, we've got um, membership numbers, but that's not, that doesn't make us personally accountable. And so to make us personally accountable, we rolled out this tracker for our customer service. So it tracks things like how many requests are coming in, how long are staff, how long is staff spending in the box, how long has it been since the customer, how long is the oldest uh, request that's in there. So how long are we taking to get back to these people on average? Um, and so that's been implemented. I expect to be able to provide a much more robust look at that uh, the next time we meet. Um, but I'm very, very excited about that. Oh, and now I forgot about the renewal emails. So the cancellation process previously was we would send out our renewal emails and then they would reply back and they would just say, please cancel my renewal. And sometimes they would be emailing from an email that wasn't, didn't have anything to do with their membership. And so then there was a lot of emailing back and forth. We had to get the right information so we could cancel their renewal. Sometimes then they would renew because we couldn't do that quick enough. And then they'd want, they'd be upset. They'd want a refund, something like that. Now instead, when the renewal em email goes out, there's no more replies. There's just a tiny form that's very small at the bottom that says um, cancel renewal. And then that goes to a form that was created on the website, and then they fill that in. It goes to Info Inbox, it's taken care of. It requires all the information that they would need in order to cancel that upfront. Uh, we had to do that completely outside of Civi because there is no native way in Civi for us to do that or implement that right now. So we are having to build this infrastructure around the failures of the CRM, and which is technically like the core of what the CRM should do allow people to sign up and then cancel their memberships and we're just having to do a big circle around it and it's requiring a lot of staff time. I just want to also put that out there. So operations has also been involved in a lot of outreach and activism stuff since there is no political action director right now uh, but it's kind of been fun so we rolled out a billboard campaign um, we are using Blip and Blindspot so that we can keep our costs down. So instead of buying a static billboard for $7,500 or $10,000 instead of renting that for a month, um, we use digital billboards and it will pop up for six to 10 seconds. And then so we can share that cost across all advertisers. We set our budgets um, for that and they've been quite successful. The hardest part has been getting them approved um, because if the board owner doesn't like your political ideology, mm -hmm. then they will reject you. So that's been a little bit fun. But 
overall very positive. <clears throat> um, I've also been working to try to support you guys, and I would really encourage anybody that is seeing an issue or needs assistance with something to reach out and let me know if there's a, a problem you see with operations or a project that you'd like to see worked on. I would like to hear about it. Um, so far, I've been working with Mr. Ford, uh, helping with the candidate, um, trying to try to set up the candidate training for Region 8. Um, I've been in, uh, assisting Mr. Malagon with vendor quotes for a convention. Um, I'm going to be working closely, I hope, with Mr. Watkins on rental space in Alexandria. Um, but I want to set your expectations. If you have a project, passion project, that you'd really like us to work on, because the fact is we're still kind of at that critical phase of trying to trying to right the ship. And so I would love to hear your suggestions. I'd love to know what we can do better. But I would like to set your expectation in that just because you see a problem does not mean that it can be placed at the highest priority. So it will go into what we have right now called the backlog, which means once all of our critical processes are done and we go, oh my gosh, we have time on our hands, then we can start looking at those things that would be wonderful to help grow the party or provide a better membership experience, et cetera. Um, but again, I very much look forward to you know, doing that with you all. And, and please don't hesitate. Just because we can't do it right now, don't hesitate to let me put it on the board as something we'd like to do in the future. And with that, I will open it up to a question. Mr. Ford. Uh, my first concern, you're not going anywhere in that show, are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, at that, yes, probably not. No. Okay. Um, on a serious note, the, uh, one of the challenges is the way our organizational structure is now is that you've got board members occupying positions that could be staff members in other organizations. You've got this weird back and forth. How is that working out in terms of communication? How do you want people who are on standing boards to work with you in terms of staff? The thing that I would most love right now, and it's actually on my list of things to do, is I would like staff to have a list of the people that are, are chairing the committees, and then also a list of everybody on that committee, and it would be lovely to have contact information. Because a lot of times, Angela will make a request, and then I don't know who's on that, commi who's on that committee, I don't know how to, to contact them, and so I'll have to go to Angela and ask, but she's got a lot on her plate also. So it would be very, very nice, particularly if you're the chair of a committee, to get a list of those people and their contact information so that if staff needs to reach out or something like that, that'd be very helpful. Um, in terms of projects, uh, which I believe your question was more geared towards, um, I am thrilled to help facilitate anything that is, uh, let's say, business related. So, I can't, you know, for instance, um, I can't make the phone call to, you know, go to members or whatever about X, Y, and Z, right? I can't communicate um, to all with, you know, individually to all of the state chairs. But that's something that if you need information particularly, I can certainly go and try to find that out for you. My job as I see it is to reduce friction um, between what the LNC needs to do their jobs and what staff can provide, what services staff can provide to you. So consider me an intermediary for that, and I'm more than happy to, to be that intermediary if you need something done. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions for operations? And this is, let me let me also say, like we're, we're way over time on, on staff reports. If there's no objection, I'd like to continue, because I think the staff reports information is some of the most critical information for the for voting on the budget. Um, we have our secretary and we had a hand, uh, Mr. Malagon and, okay, we'll, we'll jump here. Um, you might not be aware cause like, you know, you don't, this isn't, I, I, I'd be very surprised if you were cause you got so many other things to do. Um, in the footer of the LP page, there is a list of all the committees and everyone that's on them. But it's, got, but it's outdated. Where, I'll fix it. The committee listing? Some of them are, yeah. Oh, I'll fix them. Okay. Yeah, I, I can do that in a heartbeat. Or you can always ask me. I'll get you the contact information or who's on what committees. I kind of obsess on those things. So and any time, as long as Angela says it's okay, um, you can reach out to me if you need to get in touch with a, 
uh, committee. I wanted to back you up on that civvy click-through thing. There was a, a state chair who had some questions yesterday, and I wanted to, just because it really concerned me, I wanted to verify about 15 members for him. It took over an hour for me to do that. I was ready, and I only live on the second floor, but I'm like, maybe I'd die if I jumped out the window. Maybe. It was one of the most frustrating, wanting to bite somebody's face off experience I've, I've had. Um, and I want to commend you on the documentation thing. We, we have a culture in this party, and it's not to blame anybody. I think it's human nature where people try to make themselves indispensable. Like if they leave, everything will fall apart. And unfortunately, that kind of is what happens. It's one reason why I put all the party documentation on a party drive, because if, it's not going to happen. But if I were to turn commie tomorrow and ran off with all the party records, I'd have run off with all the party records. And our tradition has been, it's all on the secretary's computer, and that's just insane. So now it's all on the party server. And if you're wondering why I was like being so you know, weird about all those manuals I'm writing, that's why. Because our bylaws alone, if a brand new secretary came in with no institutional knowledge, could not read our bylaws and know how to do the job. They just couldn't. So I really commend you on doing that for staff. It's been a big, big problem in this party a long time. Oh, it's definitely me, so shut up. Oh, All right. So, it's me. so <laughs> uh, silence is consent, so that means we all know. Any other questions for our operations director? I just want to ask, like, was everyone listening and did a lot of that sink in? Okay. Do we do we also have some a little bit of shocked, uncomfortable, stunned silence at some of the challenges? Like maybe a little bit. Okay. I, I think the hostage situation remark, without amplifying the issues, was fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Hannah. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a, a five or ten minute break before we jump into IT. How are we feeling? What time is lunch today? Um, lunch is coming up. Right? Lunch is at, is it 12 or 12.30? I think it's 12.30. But I think it's 12.30. Please let me just... <laughs> I mean, if we didn't want to break now and then come back and knock everything else out. No. Be, no. That was forceful. <laughs> I know. 12.30. 12.30. Okay, are we good with a five-minute uh, break, stretch break, go to the bathroom? Yeah. All right, we're going to... We're gonna we're going to recess for five minutes. Please be back at 11.42. What a right on the nose time. <laughs> we are still live. So whisper your private thoughts straight into the owl. Let those intrusive thoughts in. We're muted. We're muted. Thank you. Thank you. Just no obscene gestures. Oh, we're going to jump back with you, not IT, but that's okay. It's been, I've had a few changes in position in my tenure with the LNC. Um, this new iteration of my job is primarily being shifted over to operations. Uh, under Hannah's direction. It's been phenomenal, um, taking on more operations work, more political impact work, um, and then still also being able to help out with Luke and uh, fundraising, mainly uh, through getting out fundraising emails. So um, that's kind of been the shift in, in the focus of my role on staff recently. Uh, I want to commend Hannah for the job that she's done in standardizing our operations. Um, specifically the info inbox. Uh, that's a project that I've been on for quite some time, uh, handling customer service through our email inbox. And that project is a beast. Um, I think that anyone who's dealt with it before uh, can speak to that. It's um, We get a lot of requests, a lot of 
obviously as a public email address, a lot of uh, you know crap, um, a lot of you know spam emails, a lot of you know sometimes nasty emails. I'm sure you can imagine um, as a political inbox, but. Um, Hannah's work to standardize how we process our customer service requests, in addition to uh, Iris, who's been a phenomenal help and just super good at learning on the job and, and learning on the fly. Uh, it's impossible to categorize every single customer service request we get in. Um, you know, obviously, unique scenarios crop up all the time, um, but we've done the best that we can to. Yeah basically categorize everything and document how we handle those types of requests in our operations guide for the info inbox. And uh, yeah, like Hannah said, Iris has been able to jump on because of that documentation and really basically be able to uh, perform all of the functions of, of the inbox. So uh, I think it's been a, a rousing success so far. The, uh, the customer service guide uh, that we've been filling out are as Hannah mentioned, it's going to give us a lot of really good numbers. You know, this the, the next down the team meeting, we're going to be able to bring you guys some hard numbers about uh, where our customer service is at um, because of that document, because of us now actually tracking our statistics. So, very excited about that. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But that's uh, my update on the, on the operation. Thank you, Drew. Any questions for Drew? Any last questions on operations? All right. Well, thank you for being awesome. Um, up next, we have, drum roll, Mr. Andy Bukovich, our CTO. What's up, Hanson? How are you guys doing? All right, sir. You need this guy? Yes, please. Do it. Newly married. Oh, congratulations. Sure. Awesome. Woo. He's domesticated now. <laughs> Less feral. He clearly had his hair, his feet shaved. My goodness. That's true. Marriage looks good on you, bro. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I know no one can read this. <laughs> I am trying to instill a sense of frustration and anxiety to prepare you to get in the right mindset to talk about Civi. <laughs> so this... It does serve a point. This is just one of the administration screens within Civi. So any kind of CRM tool that you're going to use is going to have a similar level of configuration to this. So each one of these little blue things is a link to a menu or screen that allows you to set different options. So that's how many there are. Uh, there's even more that you're seeing on this page. That's going to be roughly the same for any CRM. So. That configuration option, all that stuff that we just saw, applies to this. Just the application on my.lp.org. So when someone goes to access city, this is what happens behind the scenes. So you type in my.lp.org into your browser. That goes and looks up the actual DNS listing on GoDaddy, which then points to Cloudflare. This is our load balancer. Prevents DDoS attacks, people trying to attack our system, things like that. Cloudflare then goes to the firewall. This is, in addition to like uh, traffic-based attacks, this is people who um, shouldn't have access to our server, but somehow got the IP address or something they shouldn't have and are able to try and talk to this directly. This keeps them out. This is the actual physical hardware that Civi runs on. This lives on a data center in Texas. You can imagine there's a lot more configuration that goes into actually setting up hardware the correct way and the associated networking than just those options I was showing you in Civi. Then the hardware runs this thing called Nutanix. So you guys have heard of the cloud. Nutanix is a piece of software that essentially lets you to have a private cloud. So these are two big ass servers, pardon my French. What Nutanix does is uses the hardware resources on these servers to let you spin up virtual machines, so servers that only exist virtually, to accomplish different functions. Same thing the cloud does, but just on our own hardware. So this is things like the web server and the database server, a bunch of other things that aren't really relevant to this architecture, right? 
But so your traffic eventually all comes all the way in here to the web server, talks to the database server to get the data it needs to process your request, and then sends that all the way back over to you. So in a SaaS tool, a software as a service tool, where you're paying some company fees per month, they handle all of this. All of the configuration for everything that you have to do, besides the actual way you're using the tool, it gets abstracted away from you. These companies have teams that handle each piece of this because the stuff is complicated. By using City CRM, we're responsible for all of this on staff. As you can imagine, it creates an insane maintenance plan. So I just wanted to give you just a brief overview of all the things that we as staff, or we as a party, are taking responsibility for by not using a SaaS tool. A what tool? Software as a service, okay. S-A-A-S. Yes, you have to not speak geek. <laughs> Sorry. You have to go to English. <laughs> but so, um, to that end, it's impossible to maintain everything that we have to maintain with just one person. Realistically, it's not really possible without at least a dedicated person to each of those if you want to do it well. But we can at least limp along better with our newest hire, which is, uh, people mentioned is our new systems architect, Candy. So, as far as I'm aware, I looked into this and I couldn't find any. He's the first ever full-time software developer hired to be a software developer in the history of the park. Um, this is extremely important now that we are actually maintaining our own software. Um, so his uh, background is he's done multiple successful CRM migrations for private universities. So pretty much the exact skill set that we're having trouble with, the exact kind of tools that we need to interact with. Um, he just recently started. He's currently working on wrapping up the G Suite to M365 migration. This was in the hands of a volunteer. Um, this is going to save us about 1500 a month as soon as it's done. And so we're finally getting that over the line. Data's finally moving. We should be, uh, by the end of the year, into M365. Like I've been saying, when that finally happens, you guys will get detailed emails about what that looks like um, and make sure it's a smooth process. So um, the, in addition, he's also some like uh, minor maintenance stuff, stuff where like I am the one who has to provide the data, but the method in which we do that I already have like written and verified. He is now able to run that type of stuff for people like Hannah. So I'm not pure bottleneck. I still kind of am in anything new, but we're getting new technical capabilities that other people can do once they're solved. So, and he'll eventually start contributing to those new ones as well as he gets onboarded a little further. So, um, one of the things I've been able to focus on as a result of Kenny putting out some of the fires is this membership report for delicate allocation that we just got published. So, this was an absolute bear. Um, we put out the draft at the beginning of November to give state chairs the ability to send back any discrepancies they notice and ask about um, anything that they think might be inaccurate. So a few state chairs did take that opportunity. Every state chair who presents discrepancies had every member they sent combed over and our reporting was updated to make sure that not only are they included this time, but that type of uh, contact will be included in the future. So this is things like the Unified Membership Program, Indiana's Triple Membership Program, gifted memberships, uh, things like that where the system, there's a specific profile for how it appears in the system that you have to make sure that pattern is being captured in your reporting. A lot of this stuff, like Hannah was saying, just operations wise, we had no real documentation on it until people are saying, hey, I actually think this person should be a member. And then we go track down that profile and make sure it's now being, or that uh, like signature and make sure that that is being captured in our report. So um, the reason we have to do this be a direct query instead of just like every other CRM you can probably imagine, just being able to click a button and see your members, is because membership hasn't functioned correctly since we've fully been into City for our users. And what that means is, uh, Civi's native does not have native functionality that will actually work to determine our membership because there's so many different ways that somebody can become it. So there's custom functionality that's supposed to maintain that information in the membership tab. It hasn't been working for a very long time. So what that looks like is, so here's my contact in City. You can see here's my membership tab. It says I expired June 2nd of this year. But 
here, you can see in my contributions, there's one that would equal membership here in September. And so that membership tab is just totally inaccurate. We have to piece together who is a member through contributions, which we have to do outside of the tool because Sydney's reporting structure does not handle what we have to do. So that is the source of the problems. Why can't we just fix it? Well, because we don't have a complete software development lifecycle. So any tool that you're actually using to make money as a business, you don't just make a tool and then it's done and that's the way the tool exists, right? Every tool that's actively in use is subject to a software development lifecycle, where you discover new issues or capabilities that you would like. You design how they were new issues you want to solve or capabilities you would like. You design how they're going to work in the system. You actually write the code. You develop the solution. You test the solution. Then you release it. And you maintain your new feature or your bug fix. And then as you're maintaining it, you discover new features and bugs. And it just feeds into itself. Well, when we moved from Razor's Edge to City, we did not have this. And we didn't get it until about two weeks ago a uh, reliable process to actually be able to test changes. So the thing with the membership script, right, it's really not that complicated. It's basically taking my fix for how we determine them and then using some of the inbuilt Civi functionality to uh, create memberships or expire memberships on that result set. The problem is, even though it's not that complicated, as bad as membership is, it could always be worse. If we don't test, we could seriously break something and so it's not responsible to, without actually having this QA environment, uh, code up changes against the system. That's just now beginning to happen. But that has been why we can't just fix it for all these months. So um, we're talking about this kind of a result. Not kind of. This is a result of the racers to city migration. We're now one year out, so I'd like to just discuss that a little bit. Um, Pretty much nothing the party was able to do business process-wise in 2021, and is still able to do today. Um, whether that be membership cards, um, accurate mailers, we uh, we can send mailers now, but we still there's a subset of the people who are like, this mailer doesn't. They contact us and say this mailer doesn't apply to me, and there's some underlying data issue that we're. Oh yeah, you're right. Um, so uh, we are. Losing money as a result of just the data problem, right? That still isn't fixed the, uh, one year after the migration was supposed to be completed. And we have multiple business processes with no real documentation. And so even trying to get them stood up in city is we have to figure out like, what are we even supposed to be doing outside of technology before we can point technology at the problem. So leads to revenue loss. Leads to two primary categories of revenue loss. The first is we lost recurring contributions. So Razor's Edge, uh, you can't, it doesn't use like Stripe or any other kind of modern payment processor. And so you can't export out tokens of your recurring contributors. So like right now in Sydney, right? Everybody pays through Stripe. We go to some other platform that uses Stripe and all our recurring contributors make the change with us to that new platform. <coughs> Did not happen with Razor's Edge. So everybody who had a recurring contribution to Razor's Edge, the moment we switched, we were just signing up to not get that money from them. So we didn't really uh, stop feeling the impact of that until three days ago on November 30th. That was the last, November 30th, 2022 was the last day of Razor's. So if you had a recurring contribution that's supposed to charge on November 30th, we did not finish feeling the impact of those lost recurring contributions until a year out from that, November 30th. So we've now felt the full loss, but for the past year, part of our numbers going down against expected is that people who had signed up for recurring contributions of Razor's Edge just weren't being charged. We still have not had a real attempt to contact all those people who have Razor's subscriptions and get them back because there's uh, couldn't get uh, good data on who those people were and former staff who advocated for this change was not prepared with those lists at the time of migration, at the time the switch happened. So those are just, that's just raw income. There's also lost revenue from broken business processes. 
So, like was mentioned, uh, just recently regained the ability to actually start sending out mailers to pull out the system that we need to do it. I am still a massive problem in that process. So, like we can send about one mailer a month right now with all the other processes that we need to do that I'm the bottleneck of. Um, it equals about like one mailer per month that we can send. Since we've regained the ability to send mailers, our average ROI is 324 percent If we were to send a modest just three more mailers a month to bring it up to four, and we had a 5,000 budget for each of those mailers, for the average ROI, just by not being able to do these mailers, we're leaving 48,600 uh, projected revenue from what we've been able to do with the mailers on the table because we're in Sydney every month. And that's just for mailers, let alone email campaigns, all the time people like Matthew Butts, Matthew Butts waste on uh, inefficient phone calls. Just what staff can do is being incredibly hampered by the system. So despite all that, we have had some wins. We haven't just been complaining for the last six months. So CBCRM does have an API that allows people to write their own applications that interact with our system. Um, we have that working. We have people on the IS committee who are able to externally get into Civi so they can write code that will perform functions in Civi or around Civi. So one of the things that's happening with this is Justin Carmen on the IS committee is working on a solution that will have a much more stripped down website that just allows you to verify membership information. So at uh, state conventions, they don't have to go through the full city flow, which is really slow and cumbersome to verify a member. They can get data that's being pulled from the city database, just a simple website that we set up with uh, pools from city. So it allows us to not be as dependent um, while still using a city as the source of truth. Um, like I said, we have a stopgap staging refresh solution in place. So this is still not ultimately where we want to be. We want to be able to click a button and in about two minutes have staging be a complete match of production in that moment. So if we get bugs as a result of our changes, we can instantly have a copy to be able to hot fix. But we have something that allows us to at least do development in the meantime, which we do not have previously. So we uh, engaged a third party CDCRM contractor named Alan Shaw to help David Aiken, who I have uh, very inconsiderately misspelled his last name. <laughs> um, but David has uh, been on staff for a long time. Um, for Until we hired Alan, the framework was pretty much David would be interfacing with the states, come to some issue that he could figure out on his own, and then I'm the pure bottleneck. I'm the only one who can help him. Alan solved some of those issues, so we at least have states getting some of their tickets for him. Um, Eric Fowler on the IS committee, the new chair of the IS committee, um, has built a C sharp wrapper for the CBCRM API. So basically, what that is is imagine you have like this really long uh, instruction set to be able to do something in Civi, and then somebody basically translates that to one line, so you don't have to interact with all that. That's what that is. So it just if we have volunteers who know C sharp. They don't have to interact with Civi's kind of native language to talk to it. They can use a language they're already familiar with, which speeds up development efforts and makes it so it's a lot easier for anyone with just basic C-sharp knowledge to help out without having to also gain an understanding of Civi. So we got uh, Nutanix, the hyperconverged cloud software that I was talking about. We were able to get that upgraded. And Aristotle data is also being used as we speak. Those last two points, big thanks to Ken. He is still helping on that front, and uh, it is sincerely appreciated. So those are some of the big wins, but despite all that, we still have all the problems I mentioned, right? So what are we going to do? Um, to my mind, there are two options for what we can do with our tech stack. The first is kind of keep doing what we're doing and not make a significant change, which is organizational debt. So I'm going to have you guys watch. This is just a two minute and four second video. If I, you would indulge me. You can get it done faster, but you'll pay later. Technical debt is the concept of delaying or omitting work to complete a project or reach a goal faster, but which also causes more rework in the end. It's like building a house without a complete set of blueprints. Construction might finish sooner, but the house will have significant structural issues 
that will take more time and more money to fix later. Technical debt usually refers to software development, when the developers make sacrifices in system design and jump right into code. But technical debt can occur in any corner of IT. And just like financial debt, technical debt accrues interest. The longer the debt or backlog of ignored issues builds up, the more costly it becomes to rectify. Sometimes this debt is intentional. Plans technical debt occurs when teams knowingly want a fast but imperfect implementation, either to establish a presence in a quickly developing market or gather customer feedback. However, teams rarely have the time to go back and redesign how they initially planned. Inadvertent technical debt, that kind of happens by accident, usually occurs when developers don't understand market requirements or how to design an architecture to meet market requirements. Poor management can also cause debt. For instance, if inexperienced team members are given complex tasks and management doesn't conduct reviews, that might catch problems. Technical debt can be avoided by thoroughly understanding market requirements and decision consequences, as well as with enough supervision to run the process. But perfect project design and implementation with no elements of technical debt is rare, even when doing everything right. Need help managing your technical debt? Click the link above right, or so in the description below to learn how to We are being, debt. that's the situation where we have technical debt. We are being absolutely strangled by it. Um, I call this slide organizational debt, and I have this additional reading here, because like he says, he's kind of uh, conflating two things. He says technical debt can also be call, caused um, by inexperienced employees uh, being given complex tasks with no good review process. Uh, that's also called, that part of it is usually called organizational debt. And I would say about 60% of our problem is technical debt, where it's just the tools don't do what we need to do. And like Hannah was saying, about 40% of it, in my estimation, is this organizational debt, where employees are being asked to do complex things like FTC reporting with no guidance, no systems. And the systems we do have, we are aware that they rely on a lot of manual intervention that can't exactly be translated to, to paper. So um, this will kill us if we don't fix it. In this additional reading that I linked, which I'll get you guys all the link, there's multiple organizations listed uh, that have actually went under um, because of tech debt. Because this leads to a death spiral where it just becomes more costly than your organization can afford to fix. But you also can't do anything without fixing it, which as you hear from Hannah is increasingly the situation we find ourselves in. And so you just collapse. And then even short of just collapse, you can have really bad outcomes. You guys remember Microsoft Vista? Everyone loved oh, Microsoft God. XP. Oh, God. That's what made Microsoft me a Microsoft Mac Vista. person. You can read about executives at Microsoft describing the Microsoft Vista to tech debt. That they just had core systems that they were like, we just got to get this out the door. We'll fix that later. That led to those core systems making Vista horrible. And it was a really bad uh episode for Microsoft publicly, and they had to work really hard on Windows 7 to recover uh, from that. Like, like Karen Ann said, she switched to Mac. Windows Vista drove massive Mac adoption purely just because they didn't want to pay, like they were, it's not that they, no organization ever doesn't want to pay tech debt, but organizations get in a situation where they feel like, well, there's these other things we have to do that are actually our business. We can't pay tech debt right now, but then you die. So if we keep going down this path, I think that is our fate is that we will just keep being harder and harder to do things, which leads us to hemorrhaging more and more money that we could potentially collect till eventually there's none. Or we can take a lifeboat. So what that looks like is the inventory, inventory categorized business process needs. Um, IS committee is, was almost done with that. Uh, and then the unfortunate thing happened this summer that is uh, being uh, recompleted as we speak. Um, uh, the research software as a service and consultant options, then we have to hire one of those to implement the SaaS solution and migrate uh, national to the new tool. So SaaS, like I said, software as a service, we need a consultant who in a very short period of time has stood up the system that we want to go to and is an expert in the system we want to go to and without an additional burden on staff time, because staff time is 100% being eaten up right now just to accomplish what we have to do to like meet our bylaws requirements, get us into a tool where Luke can send out more than one mailer a month without being completely burdened by me, where Hannah can actually just do some basic administrative things without having to ask me a bunch of questions because the stuff just is a lot. Um, so, 
we do that, we can very quickly get into a new tool, and we can use the freed up staff time to integrate the new tool into City, such that City has all the data that we're generating in the new tool, so states can, who are already have their website on City aren't affected, and will still be getting um, latest and greatest national membership info on their site. While we have this free time, while we're raising all this more money, what it also allows us to do is, in addition to uh, integrating into City, City's ultimately not the solution, even if we like stayed on the, like, the idea behind City, that we have an open source tool that the states can run, that we also use, that creates one unified data, data ecosystem, is a great idea, and is ultimately where, where we want to be. We don't want to pay licensees for SaaS tools, right? Uh, or licenses for SaaS tools. And we have enough technical people in the libertarian movement that we can get there. But it has to be done with a real software development lifecycle. That has to be constraint number one, so that anybody who comes in afterwards to maintain it is able to do so. It has to be in a framework that developers will actually volunteer in. So cities and PHP, it's ancient. Facebook wrote their like own clone of PHP because their developers hated it so much instead of just using it. We got into a uh, modern framework, like a JavaScript-based framework or .NET. Volunteer developers would actually be able to volunteer their time. That's the kind of open source stuff that people actually want. Um, uh, it has to be maintainable, such that one technical staff member can handle maintenance. Um, that means offloading things like our hardware, uh, the networking, all these things, unless the party is going to be in a position where if something goes wrong, we're actually going to be able to pay the staff to our emergency and fix it, we can't be responsible for maintaining those. So we just need to get, tool has to be in a framework such that one tech, one full-time tech person can maintain it, and then if that is the case, the party will not get back into this situation. So. That's like both plan, those are two options. That's my presentation. Thank you. I have a really long list of questions. Who all has questions? I have one quick one. You have a quick one? Okay, also, who in this room has an IT background? Awesome. Pat Ford, and then I'm gonna run through all of mine. Okay, so I've always hated the fact that the libertarian party is both in the software and the real estate business. So let's talk about the software business. With this approach, is it possible to have a third-party cloud solution that's manageable by one or two individuals at the staff level, integrate with situations like Motor Gravity and Kixi on a transparent, easy to automate basis so that we can have one funnel for information without us having to supply all that freaking hardware and all these processes? Is that possible? And is HubSpot that? Um. So Hubs, yes, HubSpot allows us to do that. Any third-party tool that makes it so that we can natively define custom actions um, would allow us to maintain our membership program, and then that has API access would allow us to stand up systems such that states could connect to. Okay, HubSpot so we, has both. All right, so we can move out of this situation we're in. Forget about the technical issues, the very fact that we're responsible for this entire environment to be as nuts. So is that the future of that? Uh, so as I said, I think that's a lifeboat solution. Mm -hmm. This is, we need to do this immediately, and what I'm about to say is kind of thinking past the sale and debatable. But this right here, I think requirement that I didn't state for this is that it needs to be super easy to stand up and have an inbuilt transaction fee um, that will go to national mm -hmm. so that Part of the problem with City is that it's expensive to maintain it, and no one pays for it but National. If we build a tool, National has to have a CRM either way, right? And the states need a CRM. We, the party has the volunteer and staff experience if our time's not being eaten up just trying to swim in a sea of tech debt. To build a tool such that it's super easy for states to run, they would want to use it instead of something else because it's performant and gets them really good access to our data and has the features they need, where a piece of that contribution or that transaction fee is coming to national so that 
the national CRM is no longer a pure cost center, but can be self-sustaining and has an inbuilt source of funding to provide for it the way the national needs to, to meet its needs. All right. I actually had one thing, Angela, and it wasn't a question. It was just more an observation for people who, who might be interested, because I think it's readily apparent that the vote to move to yeah. It was not a good vote, and I voted for it. A lot of us voted for it, but it was. But there's some background there, which I do think it's important to get in the record for people who don't know or people who are watching. That was actually fulfilling a vote that was made by the LNC last term, and I actually looked up a very unfortunate motion. Unfortunately, it, it probably will mention some names. It isn't to criticize any person. It's just I, actually I'm not going to mention name. X moved to appoint somebody. To, to lead a gap analysis for phasing out Razor's Edge by the end of 2022. So that was a mandate that was provided to us by the prior LNC, just like we have mandates that carry over, um, for uh, uh, with a report to be provided to the LNC at or prior to the March meeting of the LNC, which would have been um, March, t right before Reno, their, their, their first quarter meeting. Um, staff is to di directed to provide the information requested from X to perform an analysis. What happened is nobody made note of this motion. Like when we postpone something, I make a note of it so that it gets on the next agenda or whatever. And then that LNC summarily canceled their March meeting. So this kind of made it into a mandate for us, but this report. I don't even know if the person that they were going to appoint to this committee was ever appointed, if a report was ever generated. This went into the black hole of never documented, but with this hanging mandate over our heads. And I know at the time of that vote, I knew we already had directions and unless we were going to rescind something, it was something we were obligated to do. So, and I actually think it originated from the LNC prior to that ultimately. I think a bunch of non-technical people were sold a very flashy presentation that turned out not to be wise. And I don't think anyone was malicious. I think they were excited and believed in it, and it just turned out not to be right. But for all those who are saying, oh, you guys are just blaming X, it's a problem that just became apparent now. And as Andy pointed out, oh, well, if you found this problem, it should be fixed in two weeks. That's just not the way it works. So I'm really not trying to blame anybody because I think everyone acted in good faith and for what they thought was the best of the party. But it didn't work out and we need to stop with the blame or whatever this, we just need to fix this. And I was one of the last people to come to the realization that this is as horrible as it is. So I just wanted to get that out I there. I have to pause real quick. It's 1227, I absolutely have to get through these questions, they're critical. So we're gonna let Andy say, and then I'm gonna give my questions and we're gonna go back and forth, then we're gonna break for lunch. Super fast, these three, if this is gonna go well, I believe need to be done by the AIS committee. We have the technical experience um, yeah, and know-how to I'm guide gonna, things well. I, I just, that. I'm gonna get into this. Okay. So let me just, let, let me just start. A lot of this needs to be saved for Adrian's motion later. And we're gonna talk about IS committee uh, involvement and who should be calling the shots on these sort of things. Um, and it's not people who don't have IT experience. We need to be reviewing things and, and, and nodding, but the pathology of us politicizing uh, software and IT decisions is, has got to stop. And so let's just, like, I don't think we should be voting on the next thing that we adopt. But we'll, we'll argue about that in, in Adrian's motion. Now, let me get into my questions. Dev life cycle. Can you go back to that slide? Testing and Q&A. Uh, did anything happen without, so there have been changes made. I know there have been changes made. Sorry, I'm gonna try to pull us back from talking about the past, or I mean the forward, solutions and, and all that back to like the here and the now. So we're going to be talking right now about Civi CRM, what's going on with our organization, what is staff doing and how are we handling it like right now. So have things been changed without testing and QA? So I don't mean by you, I mean in general. 
Um, there is two ways that you can make changes to Civi. The first is just configuration on the actual tool, like I was showing yeah. here. And there's actual code changes that will appear. That's the ones and zeros that's executing when you use the software. Um, the configuration changes have been. Actual code changes have not. Okay. Some other things that have been changed are some stuff in the firewall and some of these other components where there's not really a, a test. So I have a question. When there are random scripts running that seem to disrupt how we count membership and it makes numbers, where is that change taking place? Is that configuration? Uh, what do you, like when I write scripts to like get better numbers? No, when someone else who was before you and I don't, I'm not, I'm not 100% certain who it was, was writing scripts. I think we had a former staff member making band-aids. Directly there. Okay. Which is very unsafe, you should never do it. Because it did mess up a lot of stuff. Yep. Okay, so that is, like I want everyone to understand, like that was happening, there was no testing ground, and that's why sometimes when we run a membership report, it has a different number than when we ran it a, a week prior, it, and you're like, but that but that person was counted as a member, and now they're not, and it made no sense, because we have band-aids like all over the place. Um, next. Next question, what are your top three bottlenecks? Um, it was number one for sure, lack of being able to do, actually, no, and this one's time, just time. You time. see there's so much yeah. stuff to try to oversee. In addition to somebody kind of has to be the interface between what's technically possible and what the business needs to do, which is what the CTO is supposed to be. And that's at a level of like meeting and consensus building before you even get to hands on keyboard. So number one, time. Uh, number two, lack of being able to do active development. If I inherited this in an environment where I knew everything I knew, which was not a ton about Civi specifically, but I was able to just hack at the code base, test my changes to make sure that they weren't going to be able to break and deploy them, we would be a ton further along. Got it. Um, but and instead. But instead, we just can't do anything. Because you're always responding to fires. To fires. And, and that's, that's, that's the third thing, is just performance and bugs. That just, so one of the things that was happening when I first took, uh, took over is that um, the cache, which is basically a table that stores stuff that you've loaded recently, so you don't have to do a full database dive. You can just pull it up quicker. Um, we get too full, and it would just take the website down. This was happening like every two to three days. We got a script written that uh, actually lives here on the, on the database server um, that detects that error and wipes that table to bring the website back online. We just started dealing with another one uh, about two weeks ago that started popping up that it's the same, it's driven by the cache, but it doesn't bring the website down. Um, it causes like really weird broken behavior where different city components, like, like reporting components are showing up when you attempt to view a contribution page. That just started happening. We're figuring out how to deal with that. Um, Authorize.net because, so this is just Civi, right? Let alone, like, there's Authorize.net, there's Anadot, there's State Secretary of State, there's all kinds of things that need to come in to talk to Civi too, right? That we also have to maintain. Authorize.net is broken. So there's all kinds of these things that like have really big impacts on the way we do our business um, that pop up constantly. So those are probably the three. Okay. Um, how common is it to know Civi's native language? Not very. Compared to Python or JavaScript? Very not very. Okay. So, <laughs> so like, everyone here speaks English. Uh, probably a handful of people speak Spanish. Who here speaks Hmong, one of the um, small Chinese population? Okay. Cambodian. Yeah, who speaks Cambodian? Not very. Okay. Um, so what you were talking about kind of like with technical debt, so like I had to balance, it's really like Sophie's choice. When we get complaints from affiliates, like the membership, um, like, you know, Indiana, um, I think Wisconsin came in, Alaska, like I know it's coming down the pipeline and I'm telling Andy like, be ready, be ready, be ready. But it's still, he has to rip off of whatever else he's doing and work on that and it is we're like incurring technical debt in real time uh, I get notifications systems critical on Civi. are those things I should be like concerned oh, yeah about? definitely okay so like I see a lot of these emails <laughs> I communicate with him but I, I am concerned so um, 
Also, from my perspective, we inherited a bunch of technical debt during the migration because staff, it was their understanding that our motion was a directive for them to halt work on city health tickets and that we never really recovered from doing that and anything else. Um, what do you think? I, yeah, I don't know why health tickets weren't being prioritized when I started, but we have not been able to pivot to a stance where we're really actively dealing with state problems. Like I said, we've got some throughput increase by David working with Alan Shaw, but by and large, no, those are just like, if something comes in we're like, oh man, that's like, we have no idea how to deal with that. It just gets to the bottom of the pile and it will be worked okay. sometime. And Maybe. Then my last question before we break for lunch is, can you think of any other examples of organizational debt that are not suitable for executive session? I think I pretty much said everything that's... Okay. Okay. That's all my questions. Can you post that article link yep. on the business list yep. or somewhere? Yep. I'll email, I'll email it to you guys. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you guys. Um, I would just hit you with the IT hammer. So we're going to break for lunch. When we come back, we're gonna. I'm going to move that we go into executive session to discuss a few more staff-related things. Staff will be in and out during that time. Did we ever set a time with Oliver? I don't. I don't think we did. Yeah. Okay. Me too. And there will be, you know, Second Amendment and gun rights focused speakers at that. Um, so that's a really interesting thing, and I'm really excited to say that uh, Dave DeCamp will be speaking to their convention. If you don't know Dave, in my mind, he's one of the biggest foreign policy geniuses that we have in our movements, so that's super exciting, too. So that's all I have, and I'll entertain any questions. Thank you, Mr. Benner. Any questions for Region 2? Going once, going twice. All right, Region 3. Okay. Let's see, Dustin Silver Hugh bringing upstairs. The way we do our reports is uh, Dustin and I split up. Uh, I provide Dustin the information on Indiana and Kentucky. Dustin takes care of Ohio and Michigan, then he puts all the one note. When I checked earlier, the, the report's not been uploaded. When I went and checked, I said, Dustin, where's the report? He said he's going to get it up there. But regardless, so here's what I put down uh, for Indiana in our report and for Kentucky. Uh, in Indiana, we had some, some wins uh, for uh, some candidates who won elected office. Our current LPIN secretary, Clayton Sultz, won his race for Jonesboro, Jonesboro City Council, District 3. Of course, he was the only candidate that raced, but nevertheless, he still won. Patricia Warren won for Claysville Clark Treasurer with 53.1% of the vote. Susan Kleinfelder won her race for Edna Green Town Council with 30% of the vote. Um, the LPIN, November 11th, uh, the Libertarian Policy Institute came down and did an Amplified Candidate training the weekend of November 11th. About 25 people came up and did that many examples, and I think it worked out really well. Um, the LPIA, the annual holiday party, is going to be held on Saturday, December 16th in Indianapolis, at the same place. The state convention for the LPIA is going to be the first weekend in March, March 1st, 2nd, 3rd, next year at the former event center in Fishers, Indiana. Um, Donna Rainwater, who was our governor candidate back in, in, uh, four, in 2020, he had he got like 12% of the vote. He's going to seek our governor nomination again. So, uh, it, I mean, of course, others will run against him, but I mean, pretty much a shoe in there. He did a great job. Um, yeah, for Kentucky, let's see, Kentucky, the LDKY, that they had a virtual town hall for Mike Vander Bant, and they're holding, they're, they had an event with Michael Breckenwald. Their state convention is going to be the weekend of February 24th and 25th at the University of Louisville in, in Louisville. And also the Kentucky State Chair Charles Altendorf uh, has a radio show that he does in an out of Lincoln, uh, once a month. Uh, he likes libertarian, he gets, speaks libertarian issues and so on. And I'm pleased about that. That's all I had to report on, at least on my end here. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Hirsch. Any questions? Any questions? All right. If there's none, we're going to jump to Region 4. All right. So uh, Region 4 is obviously in a unique position because we 
we are one state, one region. Uh, this means I have only one chair to speak with, that's Mr. Malagon right here. Um, since winning chair in February of 2023, earlier this year, Mr. Malagon had gone through uh, parties' finances and found that the previous chair who had been held position for six years or so um, had gotten us in a situation where we had many erroneous, or not erroneous, but let's say um, unnecessary, excessive expenditure, sometimes duplicate type services, and getting rid of those types of things allowed us to save just in one year $7,500. Um, so I would encourage everyone to have their chairs look into similar things. Um, for example, I think we had you know, a Google Suite plus also um, a Zoom, like just things that you could have just one instead of having both things. Um, yes, and we have also, um, we were also, this is the first year, and I don't even know how long that we actually made a profit off of our convention, um, due largely to the efforts of one Mr. Malagon and Mr. Larry Sharp, who is probably the best auctioneer in the world. If you're having an auction ever, I suggest getting him there. Um, because he somehow gets people to bid outrageous amounts of money for things that don't cost that much. Um, and we have recently come in at a membership total of the Libertarian Party of California at 1307, um, giving us about $103 delegates at the National Convention. Um, interestingly enough, people think that California is such a, uh, I need the, you know, obviously blue state. We do have almost 250,000 registered libertarians here, and that gets us into kind of an interesting situation where um, it seems to be unclear to a lot of people that just registering as a libertarian doesn't get you membership into the Libertarian Party. That's something that I actually uh, thought back when I first registered as a libertarian. So um, we are, oh, and another thing with our membership is um, people do like to, you know, have drama going around all the state parties, but one thing that uh, we do know in California is that California itself has lost a lot of people, especially more liberty minded people throughout COVID. Many of our people have moved to Texas, New Hampshire, Arizona, Nevada, etc. So part of our membership um, issues can be fixed by that. But another big thing is that Mr. Malagon did go through, because of the issues with city, he went through individually, <coughs> checked everything, and found, I think, like around 100 irregularities. Um, and he had to contact each of those people personally and was able to get a, a good chunk of them back into regular donations. But that's been a huge issue for us. Um, so again, I don't know if anyone else, other states are having that issue, but that was a huge issue for us and you know, caused us. So, Luckily, we have rectified that for now, but um, I do want to just commend Mr. Malagon for really going above and beyond his role as chair, saving us money, making us money, and getting our, our memberships up. We hope to now refocus our efforts more towards membership uh, once all of this is done. And our convention is uh, the last weekend of February 2024 at a hotel just about 10 miles away from here. <coughs> With our Any chair. Well, oh, oh, two just quick comments. So the Libertarian Party of California just appointed Mr. Graham Brown as the California Credentials Committee representative and Lauren Dean as the Credentials Committee alternate. You so, need to email that to me. I will. I'm just saying. I, no, I'm not going <laughs> to. I'm an anarchist. Uh, <laughs> second, I would encourage all of you to check in with your regional chairs, and if they're using agility as part of a PR uh, service, I would strongly encourage you to have them discontinue that service or at the very least look at their contract. Uh, my predecessor didn't share that contract with me, and now we're, it looks like we're on the hook for something that we don't want or don't need, it, and that's uh, an incredibly daunting expenditure. Uh, so I would strongly encourage you all to tell your, and their customer service is an absolutely appropriate. It's a, it's a terrible service. They don't get back to you unless they want money. They require X amount of days arbitrarily to let them know that you're not going to renew their services. Uh, the whole thing is just an absolute shit show. So I would strongly encourage you to reach out to your chairs, find out what PR service they're using, if any, and if it's agility to uh, 
again, either request a contract, dig through it, to make sure that everything is up to snap because I, I mean, they're absolutely awful and I can't wait to get rid of them. So, so. Any other questions? I had a question, but it wasn't for Region 4. I neglected. Uh, Mr. Hurge, uh, do we have a written report for Region 3? Yes. We do. We should, uh, it was ready to doesn't okay because the secretary needs it oh, I'll make sure you get that okay thank you he hasn't uploaded it yet but he has all right yeah apparently. if there are no other questions for uh Ms. Hayes we can move on to region eight first can I suggest maybe we should all go to Dustin's room <laughs> <laughs> region eight but by intervention you mean splashing uh, cold water on his face I'm we're libertarians whatever works uh, first of all, Region 8, of course, is that fault. My new friends at the LNC, Region 8 is, of course, the birthplace of American liberty, the American Empire, and the, well, everything good about the region. Until the last hundred years. New York. And I guess if there was a theme for today, it would be lobbying versus litigation. Because the direction of, of a number of the states, some states more successful than others, others beginning that migration, is been to work with state government. <coughs> and present legislation and work through the system as opposed to some you know some really heartfelt litigation that's been conducted over the years but far less successfully. Um, in New York, the Supreme Court declined to hear the New York ballot access lawsuit, which has been working with the Green Party in New York since 2020. On a much more pleasant note, New York had 19 candidates running for local office throughout the state and six wins. Four of the wins are enrolled libertarian, to which two are incumbents running opposed one was a good campaign, but one are election not opposed. Keith Redhead, member of the LPNY Executive Committee and the owner of one, Ella Righteous Brewery, uh, was actually elected the, uh, the, 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 the Republican voter for the town of Ava Supervisor, which is not unlike a mayor. In November 2023, I had the pleasure of going to this to the Empire State Freedom Center in Syracuse. Lou Perez performed that Friday evening, followed by President of candidates John Smith and Michael Mott. On Saturday, three speakers, amazing, Shane Hazel talked about Bitcoin, Dr. Cliff Baker on medical freedom, and Dan Warmus, who's a first amendment lawyer. Uh, big projects coming up for New York, continuing to overhaul the IT infrastructure, and uh, an updated state platform uh, by a very active platform committee. We're also working on a series of outreach campaigns and we'll some press releases, call to actions, and content for social media. Maine, who continues to establish the debate, is not for folks new on the LNC, State of Maine successfully lobbied this year, passed legislation, and I'm ready. I'm hoping that anyone has any hot drinks. They got the governor to sign legislation which lowered the state registered account for major party status from 10,000 registrants to 5,000 registrants. Raised tens of thousands of dollars on their own to work on what appears to be, it's, it's going to be close, the effort would be worth support. A lot of karma, a lot of moral love here. Uh, to hit that 5,000 total in, in, in by the end of December, at which point we'll substantially eliminate the need for petitioning and expenditures for the 2024 <coughs> presidential election. A reminder to folks that Maine is a very special state when it comes to presidential elections. It is a split electoral vote. It also uses ranked choice voting for the presidency. So whoever gets our nomination will have a unique opportunity and what is probably going to be a hotly elected presidential campaign to alter the landscape of politics in this country. Uh, so to that end, uh, there have been several in-person uh, registration drives at the opportunity to vote for a couple of them. Uh, they also had this, uh, a couple of weeks ago, they had a, uh, a main convention. Jacob Hornberger, Chase Oliver, Mike DeMott, and Lars Mapset were all there. Uh, with the help of Bill Radpath and Mr. Mapset, they have obtained funding for that final stretch drive here. To get the folks. On a local activism level, uh, Harrison Kemp, who's the chair, uh, actually led a, led a charge to get to their city council to lower a confiscatory $250 per year parking rent to $25. Right. Guy changes legislation, guy changes town councils. Uh, so they're looking forward to finishing the registration drive, earning major party status, and gearing up for the presidential election. Vermont was much easier ballot action. Just about completed their state reorganization <coughs> caucus. They'll be holding the final caucus this next week, featuring ex-con elections and confirmation of party status. 
no current ah elections this year for them. they do have a candidate who is going to be taking on bernie sanders if mr. sanders chooses to run for election. you know, a lot of us normally advocate for more entry level elections, town councils the opportunity to be more anti-war than mr. sanders and provocatively so i think represents a great opportunity both in the region and the and the nation. in that vein, they continue to the efforts to grow and build on the defending heart coalition which includes libertarians and led by libertarians but also a variety of other grassroots political movements. i want to make a special note here olga or dr. duclair, we all know her as olga will not be running for re-election as state chair for the party in vermont. she's going to still remain active probably run for another office on the excom but i just want to take a moment to salute a libertarian who in just a few years has literally changed the face of electoral um electoral politics in vermont building coalitions, single issue coalitions successfully converting if you will, flipping if you will a state representative to the libertarian party being a strong advocate for everything from homeschooling to you know independent free free of the state lifestyles also making some of the best brownies and the farm table brownies in america truly a wonderful libertarian and and i hope you know i just want to take a moment to say to all of you that her contributions i think she's a model state chair on every level and i hope you take a moment to appreciate her and her contributions over the last few years because she's literally in conjunction with a lot of great people helped change the face of the libertarian movement here in new england uh new jersey very very active social schedule as well meetings that are fun and focused i've had the chance to go to a couple down jersey fun and focused yet very targeted at issues uh for example one recently so uh there is a nascent movement up in the northeast peculiar to the northeast right now uh to fight these state-sponsored wind power uh if you will contracts that states are going uh essentially granting a monopoly to these organizations uh it's feel-good greeny greenish legislation that's alice worse raising prices, they're working with that. The Stock United Nations Agenda 2030, another meeting. Uh, speakers on precious metals. They have Tammy Drew Cipperelli, the uh, sheriff of Mercer County. Next week, big party, holiday free zone. Uh, protest candidates as well as Luke Perez will be there. Also, there is a uh, James Hookett that resigned as state chair, but there will be an election next week for that. Connecticut, we'll be part of Connecticut, so they're only municipal candidates this year. Uh, Jason LaChapelle, the town of Colchester, get 15% of the vote. Uh, and is actually building a new building at that town. Their convention is literally happening as we speak right now. Maj is there, Clint Russell, a POTUS candidate, a full feature of uh, presidential candidates. Rhode Island, again, lobbying versus litigation. Lobbying efforts in which I'm involved in, as well as the state of Rhode Island Libertarian Party, for ballot, significant ballot access reforms is taking place. The goal is to get from one of the worst states in the nation to 5% on only a single election every four years. Or president or governor down to a more reasonable two percent across a variety of executive offices so that takes place also for the second year in a row the federal legislation will move into open debate in house subcommittees uh, that's all i've got any thank you mr Ford. hours later any questions at 45 minute elevator reason? thank you all right next up on our agenda let me get that back up. Yeah. Region Zero. Oh, Region Zero. Um, I would just say the report speaks for itself in the interest of saving time. Uh, but Alaska, Hawaii, Idaho, Wyoming, everything is mostly in basic. Um, there are some things surrounding Wyoming that we need to follow up on. But other than that, just please read the report and I'll take any questions if you have ready. I had. To have a question do we know who the chair of wyoming is nope i knew well uh, i believe it was at one time it was um, sean before was, yeah and he when i reached out to him about a year ago he said he was no longer associated with the party and he gave me the contact info um and i'm blanking on the name but i can go back to my bethany huh? was it bethany, bethany baldez? baldez it may have it may be but i he didn't say whether or not okay. she was the chair. She was just, I don't know if that has been made official at any point, but I texted her shortly after he gave me that uh, her contact info. And since 
then she's black. We will talk about that offline. All right. Any other questions for Region Zero? Okay, let's jump to reports of standing committees. So let's do a time check. It's 3.07 p.m. We spent a lot of time on staff reports. We started 30 minutes late. It is what it is. Let's see. Um, we're not going to be passing a budget by 5.30, are we? I mean, the, the XCOM meeting went fairly well. True. Uh, so let's not say We'll see no. how it goes. <laughs> okay, so we're going to get into Pass committee. To see what's in it. <laughs> we're going to get into committee updates. Please keep in mind um, time constraints, and let's let's go through them um, concisely. I let's will put on the timer and let it ring. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start with affiliate support committee, Mr. Ford. Okay. Uh, first of all, note Will Heinrich and Gloria and I have to join the affiliate support committee. Uh, Go down to a couple of projects. With the completion of stage one of the affiliate toolbox, a decision was made by the committee to follow three projects for the balance of the term. Uh, to my knowledge, the first time in recent memory, uh, the, uh, I was going to say the policy manual was driven requirement to conduct an affiliate survey is taking place as we speak. Uh, I'm going to ask region chairs to follow up with their state chairs. It, uh, it's sent out via email. One of the challenges we face in doing anything in the years is keeping track of these ongoing changes, if you will, in state and affiliate management. And to that end, everybody in the committee pitched in and called a whole bunch of affiliates. And we've got most of the emails and a lot of contact information for people. Um, I think we've got 30 something, and, and there's a couple that are even changing as we talk to that. So that's a shared document. I think everybody's got access to it. Just ask everybody to, uh, to update that. The, uh, the, the crux of the matter is this. Uh, the email sent out, the affiliate support committee shall identify the needs and interests of various affiliates. Uh, we quoted that. And asked some quick questions. Uh, the LC needs to put together a cost-effective support strategy for state affiliates. We have a chair that that one. What are going to be the biggest obstacles in growth in your state? What are the top three needs of your affiliate? What can the LC and affiliate support committee do to help? Currently, how many affiliates in your state? What's the process? for affiliate creation approval, how many people on your executive committee, what are the positions? Please provide the names and titles of the executive committee. Hopefully this will be helpful to all the standing committees. Uh, what's your next statewide convention? What's your next executive committee election? Critically, what areas of training would you like to see the LNC provide in 2024 regional training? Um, those are the kind of data points that we're going to use in helping push forward our next big challenge, which is to actually get regions to adopt the schedule for training. To that end, Mr. Burke, who is now simultaneously part of the LNC now, is the alternate for Region 1, I believe, uh, is also uh, the proprietor, if you will, of the organization providing, you know, providing training. So he's joining the affiliate support committee informally at every meeting so that we can take this information, use these data points, and give at least affiliates the opportunity to do training in our arts or help drive the regional training for this spring if they so choose. Uh, let's see. We uh, and I want to give credit to Jacob and to Ali and our committee for their amazing work with me. Jacob really spearheaded the affiliate handbook. There's a new updated version that's been submitted to National, which continues to refine the project. We'd ask all folks who look through that to get time to look at A, if they have contributions they'd like to make to it, we welcome them. And number two, if they have refinements they'd like to suggest, we welcome all suggestions. Uh, so I think I covered it all. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Ford. Any questions for Mr. Ford? Affiliate support? Thank you very much. I am very encouraged by what I hear. Okay, let's jump to our next agenda item if there's no questions. And that is... Okay. Well, there's several... For one thing, we skipped over APRC, but we have nothing to report. There were no Just complaints, kidding. and it's, yep, it, it's secret. Um, audit committee... All right. What's going on? Our representative, we don't have a representative from the audit committee here. The audit was completed and signed off by... Fry? Is it what, the Fry and Associates? Mark Fry yeah. and Associates 
Mark Fry is our auditor, it's completed and finished. It was also signed off by me, the chair, and our treasurer, Mr. Hagopian. So we don't have any updates on that. I believe that the process is gonna begin for a, the next year's audit. When are we gonna begin that? Okay, and we have a vacancy on that committee, I believe. And that's on the agenda for tomorrow, but the question is, is the LNC gonna be given a copy of that letter? Oh, to my knowledge, it had already gone out. No? I've never seen the All audit right. letter. Then we'll get it to you tomorrow. Okay. All right, so that's the update for the audit committee. Next agenda item is? awards committee and there was a report that's mm -hmm. in the drive i think it was mr uh dr lark uh gave that um mr watkins do we have any updates on the on the awards committee anything other than the list of items that you've requested um just wait on an email to get that down and then we'll be able to have a meeting got it okay any questions for the awards committee Going once, going twice. All right, next is ballot access committee. So Mr. Nan is not here, so how about this? <laughs> the treasurer and I, sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. We're gonna go over ballot access because I think it's really important for the budget meeting. Yeah. So I'm trying to pull up. Did did Mr. Nana get you guys a report? No, no but I have our current ballot yes. tracker. Okay, so if if you don't mind bringing up the ballot access tracker, I think the way for us to do this is you walk us through the tracker, yes. and I'm going to walk you through some updates that I've worked on myself as chair, yeah. and just basic communications. And I'll do, I'll do it verbally, uh, just because the ballot access committee hasn't agreed with some of my Yep, so this is a, this is... And then Karen Ann can correct me if I say anything that sounds wrong okay first what we talked about so um 32 states uh sorry now 33 states with arkansas are completed and signed off on uh, maine north dakota and ohio have been partially funded and are underway tennessee's lawsuit has been partially funded and it's underway um the next states up to make decisions on um, are probably going to be Kentucky and New Mexico are kind of the next ones in line. Uh, I should say the next start dates because yep. there are difference between start dates and end dates. They don't always start at the start date if you get a long time to collect the signatures. Uh, we are running into significant issues with the multiple different parties out there um, all doing drives at once and yep. things are becoming much more expensive than we had anticipated. Um, so overall, the number I have um, would look like an additional uh, $820,000 if we were to try to go after 50 states. If, as opposed to 47? As opposed to 47, which you'll see in the budget at 200,000. Okay. Um, I would like us to, oh, I would like us to move through as much of this as possible. And I do have some comments to, that could potentially be shared in executive session, but I don't even know how, how, how urgent that is. Yeah. How, how I would think about this things that we can say without making any actual yes. decisions. So how, how this works, by the way, is ballot access committee um, recommends an action. Yep. Executive committee decides on the action. What this committee does is decides how much dollars are going to be put towards ballot access next year. Yep. So ballot access committee and executive committee are the ones that are deciding how that money is spent, but this committee is deciding how much <laughs> is put forward. So if we put forward 200, ballot access and executive committee are gonna decide what states basically that goes to, is that correct? Yeah, that so correct? I have a suggestion. 
if we want to get really granular on this before we vote on the budget, and I think we should, what we're likely to do is go through all the budget discussion and possibly vote on it first thing in the morning and, and hear some more on ballot access from the ballot access committee chair first thing in the morning. Um, and if we need to do that, then we're going to amend an agenda. But I, I would wait until that actually is about to happen before making any agenda amendments or, or moving anything around. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will also say that I did have a really good conversation with New York. It's about half of their executive committee, their their chair, Andrew Colsty, two of the, their two vice chairs. And after chatting with them, they are interested in pursuing presidential ballot access in New York. I'm super excited about that. And we talked about that from the perspective of collaborating with, with Diane Sayre and possibly the RFK Jr. campaign for as a placeholder candidate. So please don't freak out as a placeholder candidate potentially um, or finding potentially Larry Sharp also as a placeholder candidate. and working with other groups to save on costs because we'd be splitting petitioner costs. So I'm not looking at adding $500,000 to the line for that. We're looking at approaching it from a, a cost-effective perspective, following Diane Sayre's strategy, who has actually you know been on the ballot, and splitting the cost with her or someone else. So we're looking at shaving the potential cost to a quarter or to a third of what it would actually cost us to do it alone. So when I'm advocating for New York, that's the amount I'm advocating for. I'm not advocating for like $500,000. I'm gonna be advocating for a, a slice of that. Um, and it's not, a, it's not a solid, but they were, they were feeling very optimistic and, and re-engaged and they told me that. So, so that's my New York update. When you say splitting the cost, do you mean, like how, what does that look like? Not beyond that. I mean, and I've, I've had conversation with Diane about that, and I've had conversation with Larry, and, and also with, with Bobby Kennedy, but nothing is, nobody signed anything. There's no paperwork, but we've, we've been kind of talking about this for a little while, so I think we're just mo we're moving in the direction of sitting down and having formal talks. But I think it, it looks good, and, and everybody is incentivized to cooperate in New York because it is so expensive and difficult. So I don't think that we're going to have to twist arms to get people to help us. We all want to work together so that we can all get on the ballot. And, and the important part about what Angela was saying is this is the way that 200,000 ballot access could easily end up at 50 states or could end up at 42 states. Yep. If we have, if we have states that suddenly you know, need 10,000 more than we thought, it goes one way. If we have ways that we can work with other people, it goes this way. If we find some people who want to help with ballot access in New York that might not have helped otherwise, you know, suddenly it swings this way. So that's why this body will just agree on the number and then the ballot access committee and Angela will continue driving towards how do we get as close to 50 as we can. Yep. It's, it's very possible that we'll have 50 state ballot access in spite of the challenges that we have, but it's a lot of this is just going to be shaking out in real time as it gets closer and closer. And that's also the, the costs per signature are, they are gonna continue to climb, but there's also some things that I would mention confidentially maybe, maybe tomorrow or later in the evening that make me more optimistic. Madam Secretary. Uh, in case the LNC or anyone watching isn't aware with the whole placeholder thing, there's a bylaw that a lot of people don't pay attention to, but the reason why, well, why wouldn't we have one of our own candidates be a placeholder? Anyone who's a placeholder candidate in any state is ineligible to get our nomination. So that, that is a bylaw that was passed about eight years ago that a lot of people don't realize. So any candidate, any libertarian that's thinking they might want to throw their hand in, if they agree to be a placeholder, they've just disqualified themselves. So so that's an issue. Sometimes it's not a bad idea to have someone who's completely outside the party because there's no chance, you know. And actually anyone upset about RFK, that would make sure he would never get our nomination if he ends up being a placeholder, but that's a that's a whole other thing. The the, the second thing is, and not everyone on the LNC may agree with me on this, so I'd be curious. Um, I've seen the culture shift in the party so many times. 
the LNC is not responsible for getting ballot access entirely for each state. That's never been our job. It's the job of the state. And um, the only exception that I kind of grant to that is New Mexico because they're a brand new affiliate. And a brand new affiliate, they're not mature. But a mature state should not be coming to the LNC asking for the entire amount. That is just not reasonable and not the role of the LNC. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, Maine, on the Maine ballot access effort, it's a registration drive. So they've received funding from us, and there are also some individual donors who have graciously extended additional funding to them. So I think that Maine is being taken care of right now. Yeah, so we've given them 7,500. They received around 20,000 from other donors, uh, and they put in a significant amount of resources themselves. I wouldn't say it's in the bag right now. Um, it's they've still got some work to do over the next four weeks, but they believe that they'll be good with a couple of weeks to spare. And the important thing about a maintenance drive is, as you said, it's a registration drive, which means once they get their 5,000 libertarians, they theoretically have ballot access forever until the duopoly changes the law, but they would have ballot access forever rather than having to do a drive every two or four years like they do today. Okay. Um, there is something. That, this might come up tomorrow on ballot access, but uh, everyone needs to be aware of this in their states. This isn't about funding, but it's sure. just in general. I know a lot of us are very much in favor of alternative voting, which I am. There's a huge poison pill going around now with people with a lot of money that are saying, oh, we'll help pay for an RCV petition in your state, but it has to be tied to top, top four. It's now just been introduced in Colorado. Colorado has the best ballot access in the country, and we're probably going to be in a lot of danger of that because they're like, oh, you can have RCV for the general, but you have to have a top four primary. And a lot of people who don't, who, who want alternative voting reform, but aren't um, too interested in third parties or more than, and I'm not saying that the RCV people are this way, but there's plenty of people out there willing to sell away the rights of third parties or not realizing what would happen in order to get RCV. That is the tactic right now. And I can tell you personally, I will actively oppose RCV on that grounds, will not sell out the LP to top four. That will be the death of the LP in a lot of states and it would, it would harm Colorado severely. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, any other comments on ballot access? I don't wanna to get too into the weeds on um, voting ballot access ballot access other states we've uh, have we touched on new mexico should we uh, touch we're not there yet okay so maybe we'll get to new mexico during I the budget it, meeting uh new mexico i doubt will come up today okay I mean, that's that's one of the next things on the ballot mm -hmm. access committee's list okay but we have heard from new mexico we have not gotten there yet okay what's the what's the cost for virginia um, so, what's Virginia, Madam Secretary, one of the states that we thought was going to self-fund? I, I think they usually do. My memory, I, I'd have to look up some, so, some so notes. I, I was talking with somebody earlier, my, my assumption was that we were going to self-fund is now my assumption that that might be something we have okay. to revisit. So, okay, so that that was what I, I just heard the same thing. Now, yeah. Kentucky... Are we ready to discuss Kentucky, or do we need to discuss that tomorrow? I believe that that is, again, probably something the Ballot Access Committee has to tackle at the next meeting. We had the assumption that Kentucky request would be one thing. It has come in higher, um, and we just need to discuss. Has anybody spoken directly with um, the Kentucky Executive Committee? Uh, that would be a dusty question, probably. Okay. I want to make sure even if it, we need to at least make an attempt this evening, someone here at this table, please reach out to Kentucky, see if you can get the chair, the vice chair, anyone on the phone, 
so that we can actually have a conversation. Um, I, I want to make sure that it's not hearsay or whatever. Like, I really want to make sure that that's locked in. I think her, Mr. Hirsch is. I'm on contact with Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anything else on ballot access? The only thing I would say is if you hear me say 47 states plus D.C. during the budget meeting, it is based on the best knowledge we have now. Correct. So any deals that add to guts, anything that changes with Kentucky, blah, 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 can go either way. But based on everything we know right now, that's what 200,000 is. Okay. So, and... Earlier in the day, I said our stretch goal was to make $140,000 a month as staff. For your budget, what do you have as our? Um, it is $123,000 a month, but for, for later in the first seven months, right. it averages $120,000. Okay. So let's look at the numbers we put. We've we've jumped from 74 is a number of the past. That's never coming back. Uh, we hit 103. Then we do we jump up to 180? Yeah, so basically, the last the last three yeah. months we've done approximately uh, $400,000, which would be 133 a month, <laughs> even if you take away the max donation. Yep. We've been averaging 120 for three months. Now. Here you go. So my bare minimum goal for staff is 125 a month. My stretch goal is 140. If I have it my way and I work them to the bone and we do it and our fundraising director is doing a kick-ass job and we're having contractors who are doing a really good job too, I think that we're gonna be able to hit all of these states for ballot access. But we've really got to be laser focused on fundraising. So keep that in mind with every request you make of staff, Sophie's Choice, is it your pet project? Is it your I have an idea moment? Or is it funding ballot access? Yeah. No and, pressure. And from a budget standpoint, today we can raise revenue and raise expenses, or we can keep it as is and then spend more if revenue comes in. Either one of those is yep. an option that we can talk through. Uh, but if Angela finds a way for us to raise 140 extra thousand, that could be put directly on ballot access at any time with a simple vote. So. There we go. I'm going to ask you a leading question, Madam yes. Chair. Yes. So do you think individuals sending postcards out defaming people is helping ballot access or hurting ballot access? I think that individuals sending out postcards defaming the LNC, it could potentially hurt ballot access. More than like hurt us, it's actually hurting oh, yeah. states from yeah. actually getting presidential candidates because they're mad about it is, something. It is possible. Okay. Yes, it that was a very leading question. I mean, it, it doesn't hurt me as much as they you know, wish it would. All right. <laughs> ballot access, any other, any other questions on ballot access? Ballot access, all right. If there's none, let's jump to our next agenda item. And that is candidate support committee report. It was submitted on time, I believe. Oh yeah, I did, it's, yes. and it's in there. And do we have anyone from the CSC present right now? Wait, was it? Hold on, I might be thinking of a different one. I'm sorry. I didn't see it. If it's not in there, it wasn't. I don't think I got I, I think right. I was thinking of I we're blowing S. past it we're blowing past it um convention I, yeah it was IS I was thinking of okay. sorry convention oversight committee Mr. Maligon thank you madam chair so I did write a comprehensive report I hope you guys took the time to read it there's a lot of good information in there I will just be hitting a few highlights and then I don't know if it would be appropriate to have a different discussion as part of this executive session if you want to do that now or if that's get to it. Uh, there seems to be some confusion about something primarily that I would like to address. Uh, the theme is become ungovernable. You may have heard differently earlier today, but I, I do believe that the theme is become ungovernable. It, that's what it says in the report and on the website and all of that, so I just want to clear that up. Uh, this another thing that I want to 
to highlight is that something is going to be done differently this year than it has been done in years past, and I want you all to not just be aware here, but also relay the information to your chairs and to your general membership. Food and beverage. Uh, this is something that has always been kind of a crux of conventions and how we waste money. We will be doing a cutoff for food before the, the, the convention begins. So it'll be the beginning of May. You, if you don't buy a food package, by then, you will not be able to buy anything at the door. We can't sit there and estimate how many people are going to try to buy something at the last minute. You've, at this point, had, by the time May comes around, almost an entire year to purchase a package. If you have not done so by that time, we can't just hold our breath and cross our fingers. Uh, it, like thousands upon thousands of dollars go to waste when something like this happens at a convention. I don't think people realize. And it puts a lot of stress on volunteers. It puts stress on hotel staff. And yes, we can sit here and say, oh, well, it's supposed to be their job. Well, I mean, that's just really shitty. So buy your package ahead of time. And as a reminder, on that note, early bird does end on December 31st. So that's really important for everyone to keep in mind if you want to get your after that, speakers will be announced. So I'd encourage you all to roll the dice. I've been working with the chair uh, to secure speakers and get everything in. You're going to be very happy with the lineup. So buy your package now, save yourself some money. Or if you really love the party, I guess don't. And then pay full price, and then we get more money in as well. So actually, maybe don't buy early bird packages. Wait till January 1st <laughs> to buy your package. I forget everything I just said. <laughs> Uh, forget that. All right. So, for volunteers, uh, the secretary has been really adamant about getting tellers. We've gotten a lot of them. She's only shy a couple, but it's always good to have more rather than less. We never know who life happens. People may not be able to come to convention. Most importantly, well, outside of that, the you know, tellers are very important. But we do need additional volunteers, so I would highly recommend that you region reps reach out to your state chairs and to the executive committees of your respective regions to see who might want to volunteer for convention. Specifically, I mean, we do have a vacancy right now on the on the COC. I would like that to be filled by perhaps a volunteer coordinator. That doesn't necessarily have to be that, but I would like to fill it with that. If not, we will have to get a volunteer coordinator that's going to kind of pack the whip and make sure that people are at their posts, taking tickets, helping with registration, doing all the things that they need to do. So the region four rep is writing something. Uh, there's no apostrophe. Is that I'll do it? Yeah, the, the, the posture, it's a big apostrophe. That's, that's, a, comma. that's a comma. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll do the volunteer coordinator thing that you mentioned. Uh, okay, so. B minus for punctuation. <laughs> Okay, so we don't need a volunteer coordinator. We have one. That was easy. fantastic. Uh, so now we just need volunteers for her coordinate. <laughs> so if we still need people to do the stuff at the door, we are providing incentives this year, which is not something that's really been done in years past. Uh, it was the opinion of the COC that our volunteers are really not getting. They kind of get the, the blind end of the of, of the sword here. So I mean, I don't know if that's great, but whatever, it's fine. You, you just use a comma. I don't want to hear it. It's a <laughs> so. Uh, we are going to provide incentives. There will be a hospitality suite for volunteers, and we will be providing minor incentives as far as convention is concerned so that you do donate your time. So please pass it along. But we need dedicated volunteers that will show up to meetings when called upon. And there will probably be separate meetings that the volunteer coordinator will have with those volunteers. So we can't just take up all this committee time doing it. So just a general ask for that. Uh, I think that's really it. Those are the highlights that I really wanted to touch on. Uh, there is one or two other things, I, I guess. Well, one I can say here. So there is one thing. I've already discussed this with the executive committee and spoken about it with the treasurer a bit. I do need to go over our budget for convention with a fine tooth comb and make sure that we are where we're supposed to be and see if that number is accurate. That was the number that was handed to me. So it gives me kind of an idea. And it, it is broken down. But I just want to make sure that we're within that, especially while we're going to search for you know, our audiovisual needs. And that's going to be something that I'll be discussing and, and meeting with someone about on Tuesday when I get back. But I'm with, very much with the treasurer on this one. I do not believe in spending money that we don't have and basing things off projections. We need to make sure that this is as accurate as it can possibly be, which is, again, another reason that we are doing the cutoff for foods. We don't waste money. Uh, we want to minimize expenses while maximizing revenue especially as uh, you know, postcards and all this stuff are going out trying to <coughs> tell people not to donate and buy packages. 
So it kind of makes my job a little hard. So if you've got a postcard, still buy a package. That's the message here. But just wait till January 1st. There is a portion of this, Madam Chair, which I believe uh, you are aware of. I don't know if you'd like to go into executive session for this. Oh, or yes. If but you would like to wait until. Uh, okay. What about that other portion? Is there uh, any? Yeah. About the schedule. Well, that's what I, it was going to be kind of a twofold. So if, if not, we can discuss that. Cover yeah. as much non executive session right now as possible, and then we're going to jump into executive session for a couple minutes. Okay. So if I'll let the secretary take it from here if you believe it's appropriate yeah. to discuss that. Yeah. I was going to bring it to executive session. Well, I, I also have something to address in executive session. Yeah. I mean, there could be more on that topic in executive session, but, sure. um, you know, publicly and we'll need to post something on the list and on the website. So originally when the COC started, a decision was made to extend business to Monday because of just historical time limitations, but it was only going to be for um, two hours on Mondays from like 9 to 11. And after hearing from a lot of members, complaining that they did not, uh, complaining is the wrong word. I think actually their complaints were legitimate, so that's probably, con concerned members is probably a more appropriate way to put it, that that was going to be their travel day that they already had off from work and they can't afford to travel on Tuesday and take another day off from work. There were other concerns as well, but that, that, that was one of them. And the more I had thought about it, we have issues with our bylaws, with how quorum is defined, um, I think we've done it wrong for a couple decades now. We're not a party at peace right now, as many people know, and the last thing we need is to have very low attendance on Monday, something gets passed that somebody doesn't like, and the party's in litigation for two years over the fact of whether or not we had legitimate quorum. <laughs> And adding just two hours. So I moved on the Convention Oversight Committee to strike Monday's business, move it all to Sunday, put adjournment sine die on Sunday. The fact is, though, we still do have the ballroom or whatever we want to call it on Monday. If the delegates choose by two-thirds vote to amend the agenda to continue on Monday, then the onus is on them and they always have that freedom. So we decided as a convention oversight committee, we're gonna to keep to a traditional schedule. If the delegates think they have the votes, that means there are people who can actually attend and we won't have a quorum issue, they can go to Monday, but we are not scheduling it through Monday. Our scheduled adjournment sine die, it's 5 p.m. on Sunday, like it normally is. So that's a bit of a change and we'll start advertising that in case anyone wants to change flight plans but we still encourage people to stay through monday because there is a chance that it can be moved to be extend extended to monday i'll only add one other thing before we go into executive session so the as you all know i went back to washington dc to do a, a, a walkthrough with the hotel staff they had a new they had that management change as i mentioned in the report everything did go uh did go well. They're very excited to host us there. They're warm and accommodating. They're, I, I think that I, uh, I know I understand a lot of people are not particularly pleased with it being in Washington, D.C., and I get why. I mean, it is more lower in the whole bit, and it's also the most expensive city in the country, literally. So, but that, that was something that was beyond our, our scope of being able to do anything about that. But I think that I am confident that we will have a successful convention. I'm confident in our hotel staff. They're very excited to have us and host us and accommodate us in any way possible. They were, uh, they were absolutely brilliant when I went there. So I would just want to add that. And before we go into executive session, field any questions that can that anyone might have that wouldn't be appropriate this time. Oh, Mr. Rara. Uh, this might help you guys clean this up. Uh, the Convention Oversight Committee never voted to have business on Monday, and neither has this body. It was just an error put onto the website. I never updated the schedule on the website. No, the Convention Oversight Committee did make that decision. I've been on the Convention Oversight Committee since the beginning. I'm sorry. That decision was made by the Convention the Oversight was Committee. Made to make sure that the contract had room on Monday in case the I'm, I'm sorry, you're just wrong. The Convention Oversight Committee, you can ask Mr. Bowen, made a decision to have business on Monday. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Thank you. Um, any other questions for Mr. Maladon, COC? Okay, uh, if there's none, we're just gonna, I'm gonna move that we jump into executive session to discuss contracts negotiated regarding uh, our convention and um, staffing issues. Um, and I would like, if I could track it down for Andy Bukovic to come in uh, just for, for a little bit to answer a couple of questions. And I really want to keep this at like 10 minutes. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. Sorry guys, we're playing musical chairs. <laughs> going once, going twice. Any objections? Here are none. All right, we'll cut the live stream here. And Drew wants you to pop out. You can try to hunt down me. Yeah. I messaged. All right, we are going live. Welcome back from executive session, everyone. It's 4.22 p.m. The next item on our agenda is the Employment Policy and Compensation Committee report. Okay, so first of all, I'm not Mr. Nikela. <laughs> Kathy Aniscavage, um, we submitted a confidential report. It's not in the OneNote. It was sent to the LNC on the confidential list. Um, so you all can read. Um, I won't be commenting any uh, anything else, except I do want to assure everybody that contrary to what you may have heard, um, Mr. Paget is not the highest paid employee, and his salary does not keep climbing with as you may have read with every new postcard or <laughs> Facebook post. Thank you, Ms. Yanuskevich. Well, he gets paid by the postcard. <laughs> <laughs> well, that could be. All right. Um, next agenda item is Historical Preservation Committee report. Yeah, let me pull that up. Uh, I have very, that's the wrong one, I have very little to add, except for I just want to draw some attention to the bottom if, if the report will actually pull up. The connection in here is not great. Uh, okay. So I, I, I put a piece of hi historical um, inf information in here. And Elpedia, if you guys don't know, I mean, it started in 2004, but it really got going as a serious enterprise in 2017. And at the bottom there were, it's that little blue box that says user statistics. So that's the first time. So I started reporting that at the beginning of 2018. There were, you know, just over 1,800 articles um, and nearly 1,200 uploads. As of now, there are 6,193 articles on Elpedia and um, almost 9,500 uploads. So. It's, it, it's growing as a resource more and more, and I, and I see people refer to it more and more. So I, I think the, 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 the project is a success and really encourage um, people to make more use of it and have your state parties upload their documents there. It's a place where they can store their minutes that they never have to worry about it again and when they switch websites, they don't have to worry about moving all that data over. But I wanted to, as part of this, where um, Mr. Bukovic had, had mentioned um, tech debt and that testing phase, it really struck home with me because we have to do a lot of changes. It's, a, it's, it's run on MediaWiki software, but their one little change affects other things. We have a parallel server. We have a parallel Elpedia. And before we make any changes on the real one, we run it through a battery of tests on our parallel one that's run on a private server. So that definitely is best practice. And the person who does this is an unsung hero. He doesn't know I'm going to mention him, but he's been volunteering on the committee for, since 2016. None of you have probably ever heard of him. And he is such a good-hearted guy who does tech work, and that's Ed Folkler out of Maryland. But he's the one who's done ever since the data cleanup that Bonnie from Vermont did, and she did an incredible job of, of cleanup of all the spam. But he's been the one maintaining Elpedia and 
hardly anyone in the party even knows about this guy, but he really is a hero volunteer. Why don't you say his name? Ed Folkler, F-O-C-H-L-E-R. All right, any other, uh, I'm back here nursing a baby, any other <laughs> questions for historical preservation? Okay, um, we last one twice. All right, well, thank you, Madam Secretary. Our next agenda item is Information Services Committee. Was a report submitted in advance? Yes. Fantastic. We do not have a representative of the committee here, do we, right? Mr. Heyman is gone. Uh, oh, he just he sat down, but portions of this will be covered tomorrow during the motion. So we could kind of take a look at that. It's going to be it's going to coincide. Okay. Uh, let's, okay. So. Because I, I do think it's important that Mr. Cook eventually go through everything and address any questions. Do we want to wait for him to come back? Mr. Hammer? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's comment for those of you who are at the executive committee meeting on the 28th if, if you weren't in your LNC you weren't required to so so no shade um, it was gone over I think in detail I tend to think we should be able to pass this and I, I, what I want to remind people is to me the most important thing about a budget is that there's a plan and that it's balanced and it's both of those things if we come into January and discover there's something we need to tweak that's what it, budgets are meant to be amended throughout the year. I know some people don't understand that perhaps on social media and make a big deal out of it. We've actually amended our budget less than any other LNC I've been on. But even if it was more, it's like the policy manual. It's meant to be tweaked to suit our needs. So I would ask everyone not to major on minors. It's a balanced budget. I've been on an LNC that passed. I think it was a $200,000 deficit budget one year. And like that just has created such a horror in me that it, if we start to see things aren't meeting our needs, we can tweak it. Uh, after listening to the treasurer at the executive committee meeting, um, I'm confident that if he put a motion right now to pass it, I'd pass it right now. But I understand some people weren't at that meeting and want to hear the presentation, but the executive committee voted seven to zero to recommend it. <coughs> Yeah, I told my wife I might be the only person that can get a budget passed unanimously in the entire libertarian. <laughs> I'm going to make you a liar. I don't think you're going to make you a liar. Challenge you. Challenge you. You did vote for it about five days ago. <laughs> so, um, all right, so the secretary has it on the screen. Um, I did add a little bit, uh, one extra page to kind of discuss. Uh, some of the other questions that came up during the executive committee, so I can try and head, head that off. A portion of this is Q&A, where I have anticipated some questions that you guys are going to ask and answered it. Uh, so try and let me get through the PowerPoint, and then we'll handle additional questions, because I think I answered most of them as we go through. Uh, from a very high level, <clears throat> we're, we have a $1.98 million budget. That seems high based on the fact that we're at 1-1 to 1-2 this year. However, you have to remember that we have 500,000 coming in from convention, and we also have um, the convention bump that we usually get with more uh, donations throughout the year. 
So from a membership standpoint, we're starting with approximately 25% lower membership than 2020. I have the comparison up on the screen. Uh, so we have significantly less membership dollars in the budget, uh, way conservative number here. From a donation standpoint, <clears throat> we have basically flat versus 2020, um, but we have significantly new tools, including Aristotle, which provides the well screening, new CRM potentially, and um, additional mail and access drives uh, that did not go on during 2020. Um, and then during convention, or for convention, it is a higher budget than 2020, but again, 2020 was a very different convention with COVID than what we have in 2024. Um, and this budget is actually lower from a convention standpoint than 2022. And since it's a presidential convention, theoretically it will be higher, so I believe this is conservative, but uh, the chair of the convention committee and myself are watching this carefully. Um, and what I have done, as I did last time, and we'll talk about, is I have backloaded this budget again so that if we have any slips along the way, we can spend less money at the back instead of cutting stuff that we're already doing at the front. So there will be ways for us to recover if we do have a slip um, as far as that goes. Fundraising expense is down significantly versus 2020. However, it's 131% increase over 2022, which we'll talk about. Uh, outreach and activism is probably the biggest change versus the 2020, which is the previous year in the cycle. Um, and, and that's significant, we'll talk about that. Ballot access, we are planning on spending twice as much in ballot access in 2024 as we spent in 2020. There are multiple reasons for that that we'll touch on. Convention I just talked about, salary uh, is not an apples to apples comparison, so I would not look at that so hard. Uh, there were a bunch of contractors before and they were in different lines and it's hard to make an apples to apples comparison to 2020. Uh, so I, I didn't spend much time on that. The important part to know is that um, the staff has been given, the ops director and, and the chair have been given everything that they asked for in that line. Um, admin, again, nothing. Uh, big changes there. Professional services, this does include outsourcing our accounting and our HR, uh, which are both positive, as we've heard throughout the weekend, uh, positive changes that allow our staff to do more things uh, that help our party grow. Uh, so from a high level, revenue includes recent improvements, but not future improvements. So the revenue in this budget is $123,000 a month, which is where we are basically right now but it doesn't include the projections of the 140 a month that the chair is aiming for. Um, our revenue is heavily, uh, heavily dependent on the convention. Ballot access disadvantage to day one. Um, again, no clear path to 50 states unless we make improvements, which I know we're gonna be talking about. Uh, additional CRM investment, which we'll discuss later this weekend, um, is currently in the budget in July. I will also talk about why that can change when it's currently in the budget for July. Um, cash position becomes very tight March through May. One of the things we're doing in this budget that we always do um, since we've taken over is look at cash position and what is happening from a, a inflow and outflow each month so that we don't run out of cash like happened in the previous LMC. And I am telling you that we are very tight March through May. So we're gonna to have to watch that. And any decisions we do make to change this budget, we need to be watching the ins and outs and what month they're gonna come in. Um, uh, and, then, and then on top of these numbers that you see, the Excel sheet have $2,500 added to historical price aggravation, both revenue and expenses. It's net neutral to the budget. Next page. Can you jump to the next slide? Sorry. Yep. Um, okay, so we talked a little bit about this, but again, uh, non-convention revenue is a 33% increase over 2023. So that is, um, that looks like a stretch goal on paper. We basically have to continue what we've been doing for the next, 
compared to the last three months for the next 12. Uh, and I'll talk about why that's reasonable. Um, and that's the fundraising expense is up 131% over 2023. That's why it's reasonable. So basically, we're going to spend more than twice as much money fundraising so that we can bring in 33% more money. Uh, chances are, if we spend 131% more, we'll bring in far more than 33% extra money. Uh, so we have some buffer in there. And the fundraising expense does include membership cards. It includes fundraising contractor and the current fundraising team. It includes well screening software, and it includes mailers. So everything that we talked about that we've liked this weekend, the budget includes. Uh, and then one of the main reasons that we're short on revenue this year is because we weren't spending in fundraising. That's that's essentially been fixed these last three months, and we've seen the results. So this is the reason to believe going forward. <clears throat> Program budgets, $200,000 for ballot access petitioning, front loaded for the seven, first seven months of the year, and put in in the months where I think we'll need it based on the ballot access schedule. Uh, so it should actually be coming out at the right time for the right states. Uh, $56,000 for outreach and activism, $12,000 for membership communications, uh, and $25,000 for campaign and candidate software, which is backloaded to the back half of the year. So that would be one of the things that could slip if we have a shortfall somewhere. If you go to the next page, <clears throat> salary and related expenses, all current salaries accounted for, multiple new positions created, contractors converted, or jobs expanded built into the budget, outsourced HR service, and money set aside for executive director flexibility moving forward. All that means is that there is a buffer of dollars where we could at some point decide to bring an executive director or somebody else could bring an executive director or we could do something with that money uh, to take over that position. Uh, admin expense includes additional CRM option beginning in July. <clears throat> Conversion to new CRM is included in the quote, so staff would not be responsible to do that work. So again, uh, this is a more intensive conversion where our staff could stay focused on the business of the party. Does not include any expenses needed. Uh, if we were to do anything as far as renting the building out, I know there was some confusion when I said that last time. It's not us renting the building. It's if we were to pursue getting income from the building in a rental situation. <coughs> Uh, I did not include any expenses that may or may not be necessary to get the building in shape. I don't know that there are any. I just didn't include any. Uh, no other major changes in this category. Professional services expense, $65,000 for legal, um, $78,000 for accounting, accounts payable, accounts receivable, FEC inputs, and monthly financial package work. $30,000 for third-party FEC filing contractor, $19,500 to maintain city CRM at a workable level. If you go to the next slide, anticipated Q&A. So these are some of the things that I thought might come up. So I just wanted to touch on that. And then if more stuff comes up, that's great. Is this a conservative budget, aggressive, or just right? It's Frankly, it's hard to tell. Based on the previous 12 months, it's aggressive. Based on the previous three months, I'd say it's just right or even a little conservative. Um, if we spend even more money and, and use Aristotle appropriately, it may be super conservative. Um, so I'm feeling pretty good about the 1.98 right now. What do we have to do in order to hit the revenue number? Again, in the original 2023 budget, we had $320,000 set aside for fundraising expense. We spent less, or we're going to spend less than half of that. So we should have spent $160,000 more dollars fundraising. That would have allowed us to raise a lot more money. As we talked about earlier, we try and get four to one return. That would be another $600,000 of fundraising we could have gotten if we had spent that money and gotten a four to one return. Uh, so what are we trying to do? We've got a $370,000 budget in 2024. That should be. Uh, we need to find efficient, productive ways to spend it, and we need to spend all of it. Then we're going to hit this number, no problem. Can't we just dip into our cash reserves and spend more? Yes, and this budget has us doing that. 
we are dipping into our cash reserves. That's why we get down to almost no money. And then the convention comes in and flushes us back up. And, and then we are a net neutral throughout the year. Um, so the point here is, is we are dipping into the cash reserves with this current budget from a monthly cash flow standpoint. We can't go further unless we have more revenue, which hopefully we'll get. Is our convention estimate too aggressive? We talked a little bit about this. It is way more aggressive than 2020, but it is still 5% below 2022. Uh, so there's, there's a good reason to believe we can hit it. Uh, as we get more and more data, uh, Adrian and I will will bring it to the table if we need to make any adjustments. Next one. Uh, why do we need to spend so much on ballot access versus 2020? Multiple reasons. Um, so I'm not going to uh, get us in any more hot water. I know everyone was all fired up last time. This is the deal. We had we had a few different things that are happening. We've got a whole bunch of people petitioning at once. We got multiple independent candidates, Green Party, no labels, some new things that weren't happening last time. Petitioning cost is going up. We also had less ballot access coming out of 2020 than we did versus 2016, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of stuff. Not blaming anybody. Uh, it's more expensive. We, we were able to get 50 state ballot access last time for 100,000. 200,000 is getting us to 47 states. Make your own conclusions. Ballot access is more expensive this time around. That's why we're spending the money. Okay. Um, we haven't broken out state by state. It is what it is. Uh, it would cost us hundreds of thousands more to get to 50, which we are working on plans to, to lower that number. Uh, what are the three states we would have to leave off of ballot access? I don't know. I don't get to make that call. I'm telling you that we can afford 47 based on the current states. Uh, the ballot access committee will make the recommendations and the X time will make the call. Um, so I haven't chosen three states. I'm just telling you that based on the numbers we have right now, we can afford 47. Okay. Uh, if we find ways to lower the cost, like we talked about earlier, there's ways that we can do it. Okay. Uh, the outreach activism budget is down $429,000 versus 2020. What aren't we spending? A significant amount, obviously. So we are spending 274,000 less in candidate and campaign support, and we are spending 181,000 less in branding. So that is a significant amount of stuff we're we're spending less. Uh, so that's just it is what it is. We're going to focus on ballot access and fundraising expense because that is going to be more important in 2024. Um, at this point, what is the new CRM? <clears throat> How much is it? When will it be voted on? I believe the motion has already been introduced. Whether that one passes or a different one, the chair has expressed the desire to have this in the budget. After careful considerations, I put a bid year for cash flow reasons. Uh, if we make any changes, uh, we can pull it forward. It's just that for cash flow reasons, we were too late on being able to do it earlier without making other cuts. Uh, next slide. Month to month. Um, First annualized. So this is the last slide. Uh, and, and when I send you guys the budget tonight, it will be broken down month by month, line by line. What I want you to understand is, so why do we do month by month? That's so that we don't have a cash flow shortfall and run out of money. It helps the staff understand how much they should spend, not can spend, which is what we'll talk about the difference. How much they should spend each month and guides the LNC on what we should approve, not what we can approve. Uh, it is purely a um, projected, like this is what we should do. Is the monthly budget binding? No, it is not binding at all. Uh, the annualized budget is the only item that shows up in the bylaws or the policy manual. I cannot tell us how much to spend each month. I can tell us what happens if we spend too much. Um, and that's what I'm doing with the month to month budget. Um, what is the process for amending the budget if we were running over? Again, this only has to happen if you're running over the annual number, not the monthly number. We bring amendments forward to the broader LNC. If we were going to outspend the annual number by over 10%, or if we want to move funds from one budget line to another, it's a fairly easy process. We've done it a couple times this year. Um, how did it work this past year? 
just this budget monthly budget in general. It worked very well. What we did was we backloaded the budget, which meant the first few months we were only spending like 80 grand, and at the end we were spending over 120 grand. Well, we we ended up having lower fundraising, and so what happened is when we had less money coming in, we didn't suddenly have to cut the budget dramatically by hundreds of thousands of dollars from a like firing people and stopping projects that we were starting with. We simply didn't spend the extra money that we planned on spending. So we've done that again in this budget where we have backloaded to a degree and there will be things that we just won't do if the money doesn't come in. It's the safest way to budget uh, and that's why we're doing it. So we were able to remove $600,000 from the budget this year without drastic layoffs and spending cuts. All right, so I talked a lot and I talked fast, but what questions do you have knowing that you'll see the spreadsheet tonight? Why are you also our accountant? <laughs> I am not an accountant. I have a, I have a strategy. This may have already been a question, but uh, I ran through no labels uh, ballot access people in Rhode Island of all places, and which is an extraordinary jump to 40,000 people in Rhode Island, paying 20 bucks an hour. What type of underlying cost structure are you assuming the petition is going to be in there? So we have been seeing, and, and Madam Secretary can jump in there, we have been seeing anywhere between 6 and upwards of 12 or 13 per signature. Is that right? Uh, the ones that we've been talking to so far. Yeah. And that's not for party petitions, that's for ballot access petition. Party petitions can be over 20 bucks. Mr. Malibu? Madam Chair, we don't need to discuss that we have money for the 47, as you said, for the ballot access. We don't, I'm assuming that part of the discussion was already had, but we don't really do it anymore if things work out the way that we're hoping we have to start. Yeah, you know, correct. Day, correct. So, for all 50, uh, it really depends on whether or not we can um, consistently meet our minimum goal and then jump to our stretch goal throughout the year. Um, and if we can do that, and staff has a really good understanding of how to do that, if we can do that, then I have no worries about balance. Yeah, if we were to average the 140 that we've talked about, that would be 20,000 extra a month. You've got kind of a seven month ballot access season. You've got another 140 to work with. It, it puts us in the ball game. Any other questions? For, oh, yep, Madam well, Secretary. Um, comment that it, I don't, I haven't gotten the recording up yet from the executive committee meeting, but I'd like to say it again here for the people who weren't at that meeting, and I think Mr. Hagopian agreed. Um, there's multiple reasons why leading up to convention, things get super tight. And one of those is a policy manual amendment that was passed maybe four years ago, segregating out convention funds, because what used to happen is LNCs would raid that money. And then when the hotel bill and everything came due, they didn't have it, and they'd be carrying a balance on that. So the, the last LNC took out a loan, and there was a huge outcry over the loan. And I think there's a huge misunderstanding as to why there was an outcry, at least for most people. Can't speak for everyone. It wasn't that they took a loan. Sometimes you have to do that. Businesses have to do that. It was what they took it out for, which seemed to be like pet projects that weren't absolutely necessary. Part of it was also for staff salaries, and absolutely no one that I talked to had a problem with them taking out a loan for necessities. I would encourage us not to be scared if that comes to fruition, but be sure it's not things that aren't necessary to keep us going or commitments that we already have. Um, it was mentioned before, and I agree with that. I think we should have an open line of credit. So it, that's not used, but is there so that we're not waiting weeks and weeks and weeks for an approval if we're in a situation where we need to pay staff, for instance, you know. So just wanted to make it clear, the anger last time I don't think was about taking a loan. I think that was a, 
in a lot of cases is a responsible thing to do it's what are you spending it on like you all have credit cards if you're going out and spending it on something you know some luxury that's bad but if you have to eat that week and you know you're going to have more money in a month yeah go use your credit card to buy food thank you madam secretary any other questions I had a separate one, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, maybe I'm misunderstanding the policy manual or maybe it's worded vaguely and I'm just going by custom. You had that if the budget went over by 10%, we'd have to amend it. It was my understanding that it was categories or line items going over by 10%. Okay. Yes, I apologize. It's each individual line item. Okay. It to be amended if it's going to go over. Okay. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't like... No, you're asking okay. the right, so that's if you to increase ballot access or if we're going to go over in ballot access by more than 10 percent okay have to come back and amend the budget all right thank you any other questions uh mr treasurer do you have anything else for us right now no i will send the, out the excel sheet to everybody it will have month by month category by category if anybody has questions beforehand get it to me early so i can answer for the group otherwise we'll just answer questions yeah. What yep. will be the difference between what you sent us tonight and what you gave us? Oh, just that the it's historical true. preservation. Say it once. Oh, no, that was in there that time too. Yeah, the the one I sent you guys, I, I believe I sent you guys last time, or I showed it on the screen. You showed it on I, the screen. I have not made any changes. Okay, so it's the it's same document the same. we already have. Okay. Yeah, not everyone's seen it, but it's the uh -huh. same document okay. you guys saw. Hey that. guys, let me do it. Let me take a reading of the room. It is. 454. We adjourn at 530. Do you want to attempt to knock out a couple of things off of tomorrow's agenda? We'll probably we could probably still get out 10 minutes early. And then you have an hour plus before we have our fundraiser for this evening. I was suggesting doing the two very quick motions which are 10A and 10C. So can we not I'm sorry. Can we not adopt the budget now if we want to um, there were people who weren't at that meeting. I think they should be able to look at the spreadsheet. Yeah, let's make sure everybody's looked at the spreadsheet. Um, is there is there an appetite to adopt the budget now, or do you want to jump to new business with previous notice continued? We've got A and C that would go quickly. I'll make a motion to adopt the budget right now. Second. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I, I mean, I've been over it. I've, I'm waking up, you know, with uh, dreaming about it. Do we have any discussion on adopting the budget? Oh, here we go. Just for clarity, the ex column voted 7 0 on this, correct? Yes. And this was? Uh, 6 0. Oh, no, wait. No, 7 0. Michaela jumped on. 7 0. That's correct. Madam Secretary? Um, because tomorrow is a separate meeting in, in, in the session, if after tonight somebody reads that spreadsheet, um, I intend on voting for the budget. But if someone comes to me tomorrow and says, I read the spreadsheet and I'm having some misgivings, I'll do a motion to reconsider on your behalf if you voted no for matters of conscience. Because I, I, I want everyone to have their say. But if if there's an appetite to adopt it now, I'd rather just adopt it now. But you can reconsider tomorrow if for some reason something strikes you in the middle of the night. I'll, I'll move the reconsideration for you. All right. Any further discussion on adopting the budget? Okay. If there's no further discussion, we're just going to go to a roll call vote. Mr. Banner? Yes. Mr. Ford? Yes. Mr. Hagopian? Yes. Mr. Heyman? Yep. I will vote yes. Ms. Hayes? Yes. Mr. Maligon? Come on. Pass. Aye. I'm kidding. Mr. Hirsch? Yes. Mr. Rufo? Yes. Ms. Vest is not here. Mr. Watkins? Yes. Ms. Yaniscavage? Yes. Madam Chair, it is 11-0-0. Um, I'm going to vote yes. Well, that was good reading. 12-0-0. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
is um, one of the least contentious budget meetings uh, the LNC has probably had in a while. Wow. I, I don't know. Ever since I've been around. There you go. <laughs> okay. Um, we have a full discussion ahead of time. And there are no surprises. I've been surprised as we were. It was hard to think of it for the last two years in the next time. The point of a meeting like this is to do your homework ahead of time. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, um, if there's no objection, I'd like to uh, move to amend the agenda to next address new business with previous notice items 10A followed by 10C. Second. Second. Any objection? Do, 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 takes two thirds. Going once, going twice, hearing none, the agenda is amended. Next up, we have 10A extend special rule of order for these minutes. Okay, the, I, I stuck it in the one note and I explained the reasoning for this on the uh, confidential list um, because there was some confidential reasons for why um, I required extra time. Normally for auto approval, minutes have to be out in 30 days of a meeting. Believe it or not, this one probably won't take me as long, but full LNC meetings minutes with the way I do them, they take about 40 hours to prepare. I know you might not think that, but they do. Yeah, I see you, Mr. Malagon. And um, there's some other obligations that you all are aware of that I have for December. So I move um, for one time special rule of order, giving the sec secretary an additional 30 days to prepare minutes under the auto approval rule for the December 2023rd in-person meeting. So I'll have 60 instead of 30. And, and just an FYI, that auto approval rule isn't a deadline. My deadline actually is the next in-person meeting, but I like to do the auto approval just to speed things up. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to move for special rule of order, giving the secretary an additional 30 days to prepare minutes <laughs> under the auto approval rule for the December 2023 in-person meeting only. Any objections? Do we need an in I don't know. I don't for that. Right. Going once, going twice. Okay, hearing no objections, the motion passes. All right, our next uh, item of business is 10C, appoint Karen Ann Harless as National Platform Committee second alternate. This was noticed by Dave Benner. Yes, uh, I think we're all well aware that uh, our secretary is one of the hardest working people in the party. And she <laughs> spreads herself thin. I mean, I think she's on 60 billion other committees, but she did express interest in being the second alternate to the platform committee. And frankly, as someone that's on that committee, I think it's a damn good idea. I really appreciate her insights and the experience on that committee. And the way that this occurs, from my understanding, is you have a voice, but not a vote. So you could attend the meetings, but wouldn't have an official vote on the committee. And there's zero chance that I would move up to a regular role because um, Albert V is first alternate and he's an alternate in Virginia. He's eager to be a full member of an LNC member. And I don't think any of our LNC members are going to drop off. So um, even um, if one did, Albert V would move up. I just believe, and I spoke with Mr. Benner about it, there's some items that might come up that I have a historical knowledge of that I would just like to be able to offer those insights to the committee. I have no desire to be a voting member. Seconded. Uh, Mr. Maligon? take away from your responsibilities on the convention oversight. No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, that was a point of order. Um, <laughs> it was a point, all right. <laughs> um, any further discussion? Any objection to appointing Karen Ann Harless as National Platform Committee's second alternate? Going once, going twice. Okay, hearing no objection, uh, Karen Ann Harlos is appointed as our National Platform Committee second alternate. All right, that brings us to the close of today's business at 5.01 p.m. 